statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Primetime show on Talk TV and radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. Good morning to you and welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV. We are on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, the landmark cast review into NHS transgender services for children says the evidence for allowing kids to change gender is based on remarkably weak evidence and calls for an end to rushing children into treatment and a ban on puberty blockers for under 18s. So, all the stuff we've been calling for for years on this show. And post office justice campaigner Alan Bates has branded his former bosses as thugs in suits as he gave evidence to the Horizon IT scandal yesterday. We're going to wait a few more weeks to hear from the bosses he's accused. And Champions League games will continue to go ahead across England, Spain and France, uh, despite security threats of terror plots. We've got lots to talk about on the show, plenty coming up. That's after the latest news headlines with Emily Rose Adams. This is Talk TV News. Good morning. A major review into gender services is calling for a more cautious approach to children who are confused about their gender. It found children have been let down by lack of evidence on medical interventions in gender care. Well, the review, led by Dr Hilary Cass, is calling for a more holistic approach to the services, especially for children with mental health needs. And Cass says the young people who are presenting to gender services are a lot different to those they saw 10 years ago. So the original cohort of young people was really predominantly children and predominantly birth registered boys. And now the predominant group is birth registered girls presenting in early teens. Uh, and the other significant change has been the numbers have gone up dramatically from less than 50 a year to now um, um, more than 3,000 a year. The Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has defended the decision not to stop arming Israel, saying none of our closest allies have done so. The Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron made the announcement on his US visit amid growing pressure over the government's weapons trade with Israel following an airstrike which killed aid workers and the ever-increasing humanitarian crisis in Gaza. The Prime Minister has launched a fresh crackdown on retail crime with violence against shop workers to be made a specific criminal offence. Persistent shoplifters could also be forced to wear tags. Victims and safeguarding Minister Laura Farris has suggested that shoplifting is by and large linked to organised crime rather than the cost of living. Well, this shopkeeper in London has told us it's hard to see how these measures will be implemented. Shoplifting has almost been decriminalised and it was out of control. We had so many staff leave uh, the job. Um, they're threatened uh, with violence and abuse. So this is a step in the right direction, but I'm not entirely sure how they're going to implement it. We have existing laws, we have existing legislation, but if the prisons are full and they're threatening uh, to put uh, offenders who uh, attack shop staff into jail, then where is this space going to come from? Meanwhile, 7.4 million adults are struggling to pay their bills due to the cost of living crisis. That's according to a new survey by the Financial Conduct Authority, which found one in nine adults had missed a bill in the six months to January. The same proportion of people had no disposable income. Despite slowing inflation, energy bills and food prices remain much higher than they were a few years ago. 
The U.S. state of Arizona has reinstated a near-total abortion ban. The laws, which were abolished 160 years ago, have been brought back, which could make abortion punishable by up to five years in prison unless a mother's life is at risk. And it could see clinics shut down across the state. It comes two years after the historic overturning of Roe v. Wade legislation. Well, Arizona's governor says she's going to fight what she calls extremist county prosecutors who brought it in. I'm devastated by this decision, and I know that many Arizonas, Arizonans are as well. We are 14 days away from this extreme ban coming back to life. It must be repealed. And another Bridget Jones film is in the pipeline. A fourth movie will see Rene Zellweger, Hugh Grant and Emma Thompson all reprise their roles. It's called Bridget Jones' Mad About the Boy and is set to be released on Valentine's Day next year. You're up to date. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazneen Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, a chilly but sunny start across many parts of Britain this morning, but rain already across the west will be steadily moving eastwards through this afternoon. Some heavy downpours, especially for western parts of Scotland, where there's a warning for the rain from the Met Office, valid until 10pm as flooding issues are possible there. The rain most persistent across Scotland, patchy in nature across England, Wales and Northern Ireland, reaching eastern England by the end of today. But it is feeling mild compared to recently temperatures up to around 14 degrees Celsius. And it stays mild overnight. Night, noticeably so compared to last night, but cloudy and wet conditions continue to move eastwards and southwards as the cold front moves rain across northern and western parts of England and Wales. Further south and east, it will be murky, but I think mostly dry there and becoming drier for Northern Ireland, but wet everywhere else. And then through tomorrow, we'll continue to see the rain clear away eastwards and southwards. That cold front, though, lingering along the south coast, so quite a cloudy, damp, dull day there, as well as feeling cool. But everywhere else, some good spells of sunshine, brighter conditions, and mainly dry and also feeling fairly mild with temperatures up to around 16 to 17 degrees Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Well, uh, good morning to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. This is Talk TV. As you'll notice once again, uh, seems to be every Wednesday at the moment, we are in our old radio studio. But uh, uh, so none of these auto cues and all of that nonsense. So bear with me. It'll be a bit more putting on the glasses of, of reading things. But uh, you don't really care anyway because most of you are listening rather than watching. So that's fine. And anyway, it's what we say that matters rather than anything else. And goodness me. Have we got a lot to say today when it comes especially to that big story today, which is the cast review into uh, well, the extraordinary outrage, disgusting, immoral and absolutely, I would say, criminal treatment of children who believe they're transgender. Not trans kids, because there is no such thing as a transgender child, but children who mistakenly believe that they are transgender. Well, they have been medicalised beyond belief. Their lives alters, their bodies mutilated. Their uh, ability to ever have a fulfilling sexual or romantic relationship probably damaged for good. Uh, many will see their life uh, living well, less years because of the treatment they've been given, all in the name of a political ideology. Well, that hopefully, hopefully ends today. Well, let's talk about that with my guest who's joining me uh, all this morning. That is Benedict Spence, who's a Conservative commentator. Uh, good morning to you. Um, it is extraordinary, this cast review. It's taken four years. 388 pages. We've had an interim review published beforehand. Today is a day, although there's been quite a lot of um, sort of leaks of what was in the report, and a lot of it, frankly, to be expected from anyone sane or sensible who looked at the evidence. Um, key findings, let's just go through those. There is um, basically uh, no good evidence uh, for treatment of children um, uh, with these transgender people blocking drugs. Um, uh, they say that evidence is based on shaky foundations. There's no good evidence of long-term outcomes. No. Uh, the Hillary Cast, paediatrician, by the way, a former president of the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, she might know what she's talking about. Uh, she has called uh, for an end to puberty blocking hormone drugs under 18, extreme care for anyone aged 17 
to 25, like basically saying, look, you need to be taking far more care about this. A holistic therapeutic approach is uh, more appropriate. And um, are pointing out that many who believe they are trans have experienced trauma, neglect, mm. abuse. Uh, many have uh, autism. Uh, other health, mental health problems, uh, or in the case of girls, often they're simply lesbians, they're gay. Um, uh, basically said there's also no clear evidence for social transitioning as being positive or negative. I mean, <laughs> tell us something we didn't know. Is there anything in this report today, Benedict, that we didn't know already and that the medics carrying out this treatment didn't know? No, I, absolutely not. And it, it's one of those things where you know, I think a great deal of people have known for a very long time, and in fact, I'd say the majority of people, even if they weren't aware of the, the of the evidence that existed, a lot of people in their gut knew that this was the case. People working at the clinic, absolutely, lots of mass resignations. Absolutely so. And I think that, it, I mean, it shows really quite the levels of sort of hysteria and mania that we've got to a position where we actually need a thorough report to say, no, this isn't the case, this isn't the case, this isn't the case, at which point you're sort of sat there thinking, well, where on earth did these sort of myths enter the public discourse as being based in scientific fact? Because we are told it's pushed yeah. on us by so many activists and yeah. activist medics as well. Let's be clear, yeah. it's not it's not sort of universal. A lot of doctors do actually buy into no, this. Sort of no thing. one at Stonewall or Mermaids mm. held the arm of a doctor, twisted it behind his or her back. Exactly. Sorry, their back. Um, <laughs> Have to be right on now, um, and force them to give puberty blockers to a 12 year old child. No, absolutely. No not. one made them do that. They mm. did that in breach of the Hippocratic Oath they mm. took when they became a medic. Yeah, I suspect it is a minority of doctors who have ever actually held this view because actually most doctors are sensible. I mean, you have to be, one would hope, to become a doctor. Well, you have to be but fact based. Yes, you have to believe in evidence, even if you don't sort of you know move with the times. Doctors yeah. can get quite old and stuck in their ways, but still, at some point, you have to be quite rational about these things. Uh, yeah. it, but ultimately, it's it's a relief actually to see that this has come out and now it depends entirely on what our political elites, our social elites, our media elites choose to do with this fairly clear information. Do they actually go with the science? Or do they become science deniers, so to speak? Yes, and well, they're very big dangerous. on the science, apart yes. from when the science uh, doesn't argue in their case. Which um, science is it? No, it exactly. And again, there's only one There's only one kind on this because in terms of the evidence. But the thing that worries me about this, this cash review is mm. that everything in this review which is entirely correct, science-based, fact-based, ev you know, evidence-based. She's been looking at this for four years. This is hundreds and hundreds of pages of evidence. Um, we knew already, and all of the medics at the Tavistock Clinic and elsewhere knew all this already. We knew that giving puberty blockers to children was unevidenced. We knew there was no scientific evidence for whether this was good for children, whether this would save lives. We knew there was no long-term evidence about the impact. We knew that it made children infertile. Uh, we knew that it meant that they could never achieve sexual gratification. I know it's a small point, but maybe most 13 and 14 year olds wouldn't have thought about that. And we knew that children couldn't possibly at that age possibly understand that. Parents being told not to give their children more than a half a paracetamol, being told, no, no, put your child on a puberty blocker. We knew there was evidence of long-term injuries to or damage to, to brain function, uh, to, to get risk of, of cancers and goodness knows what else. They knew all that, but they did it anyway. They also knew that most of the children turning up, asking for help, claiming they believed they were transgender, because, by the way, no child is transgender. They knew that most of those children either had autism or were suffering from post-abuse, neglect or some other trauma. They also knew that the huge increase in the number of girls who were turning up from a matter of a, a, a few dozen to a few thousand in a matter of a few years was the result of, let's face it, uh, social media uh, campaigning, uh, an awful lot of, uh, of, uh, of the sort of social sort of, I suppose, just sort of intoxication on, on this issue. This was the latest thing. And that a lot of those girls were actually lesbians. They were actually young gay women who would have gone on to have a perfectly happy life as a young gay woman, but have been told, no, no, really, you're a boy. They knew all this, and yet they medicalised those children. They mutilated those children. They told them to bind their breasts. They told them to cut their breasts off, to cut off their genitals, to change their bodies irrevocably without full consent, because you can't consent to that when you're a child. You don't understand the implications. And parents were browbeaten into going along with it, being told, but if you don't, your child will commit suicide. Again, another complete lie. I have no idea what will happen now, and whether or not all these recommendations will come into force. Some already have, some I suspect will be got round. But what I really don't understand is how any of the 
ideologues, the people pushing this, the political trans activists, and especially the doctors and the nurses who are carrying this out, how they sleep at night. Because there is a special place in hell for people who abuse children like this, and you're going to be in it. Um, Benedict, um, do you think things will change? I fear that they won't, or that there will be a lot of pushback. And I feel that actually because that is because the Labour Party are going to be the next party of government. So, and there is a lot more, I think, motivation on the left than the right in this yeah. country to push this kind of thing. I would hope, therefore, that a lot of pressure is brought to bear on the Labour Party and that actually we should just you know, forget talking about it to Tory MPs because a lot of them have disgraced themselves over this anyway. They're not going to be the party government for some time. This is where the pressure needs to be brought to bear and it needs to be brought home to a lot of these people that actually the traditional communities that are Labour communities, Labour heartlands, are a lot more socially conservative than a lot of the radicals and the upper middle classes of London. This is not what they want, this is not what they believe and they agree largely I think with, with what you've just spoken yeah. that this is wicked and that yes, this is child is. abuse. They will not look kindly on this, they will not reward them for this, they will not look at them and go, oh it's very progressive that you're getting around the yeah. science. They will just say no, you are denying the truth that is here in black and white that we all know you are putting our children at risk and we won't have it. And I yeah. think if Sikir Starmer were a brave man, he would take a stance on this. Starmer still thinks some women have penises, exactly. I don't think he will. And if he does, you'll know he just... What, Everything he says is for effect, mm. or what's the local latest focus group said, as opposed yeah. to what he knows to be true. When it comes to the safety of children, I think you should just always do the right thing, no matter what. Well, I want to hear your opinions on this. Children who believe they are transgender, because remember, there's no such thing as a trans kid, should not be given puberty blockers with thousands of youngsters let down by the NHS. That is what a landmark review has concluded. Uh, I want to know, what is your reaction to that? Give us a call, 0344 499 1000. You can text on 8722. You can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Can't wait to get your messages and you, especially your calls. Remember that number, 0344 Double nine one thousand. Um, let's uh, let's move on to uh, an, another story. I mean, just very briefly. But William Rag, that Tory MP at the centre of that Westminster sexting scandal, um, has quit the parliamentary party. Well, he probably told, for God's sake, you've yeah. got to go, man. He resigned as a select committee chair and mm. vice chair of the nineteen twenty two backbench committee. Um, basically, this is a man who who got. You know, caught up in a in a honey trap sting, sent pictures of his naked todger to a complete stranger, and then when he was basically blackmailed on it, he, he gave other people's numbers out. Mm. Absolute treachery. I've been banging on about this all week. It's absolutely extraordinary that people like Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, were saying, oh, you know, he's courageous for coming forward. No, he was a, he was a weak and weaselly mm. um, uh, you know, tr you know, traitor to have done what mm. he did, giving out numbers of other colleagues, male, female, and also political journalists too, to this blackmailer. Um, Scooty stepped down. Well, he's, we know he's stepping down as an MP anyway. Yeah. It, it, it's, he's lost the Tory whip. But does this show weakness on Rishi Sunak's part that he didn't immediately go, well, mate, you're out? I think so. I think it's quite bad that it's the individual themselves that are sort of slowly drip-fed their resignations from this select yeah. committee and this group and now the party. It should have been, I think... From the start, I understand perhaps why, if there are ongoing investigations, maybe you know they didn't want to sort of jump the gun before that. But there are th some things actually that I don't think you can forgive. And even if you were to take the idea that he is a victim of blackmail, that doesn't mean you just get away with these no. things. Would he have had to have broken the Official Secrets Act before somebody took an action against him? We don't know who. This, apparently, we still don't know who was blackmailing him. It could be just be someone for money. It could just be someone having a laugh. We still don't know how widespread this is. It's yeah. entirely possible if he was so ashamed that plenty of other people have not come forward. Other people might have revealed information to other people blackmailing them and haven't yeah. come forward because they're ashamed. I understand it's a very delicate situation, but I think it's. I think everyone agrees him losing the whip was an inevitability and probably yeah. should have happened. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's Let's also talk about European Court of Human Rights. Talked about them quite a lot, haven't we? The most extraordinary, I mean, just absolutely extraordinary uh, decision uh, yesterday. Um, I mean, I, I have no idea on what planet this has actually happened. Uh, but the court has basically ruled in favour of a bunch of uh, women in their 70s. I say elderly. I'm, I'm not, not too far off that. <laughs> set. Keeps pointing out as mid fifties. Thirty-five um, isn't middle aged, Julie. Yeah, what is this? Oh well, then you can come again. Um, but a, basically, <laughs> a bunch of women, el elderly women in their seventies, who climate activists have taken a case to the court, arguing that they are at higher mm. risk from heat waves, mm. and therefore they're at higher risk um, of the uh, Swiss government not going along with their net zero um, pledges and bringing in enough measures to tackle climate change. Mm. And this European Court of Human Rights, which by the way is not. You know, the people, the judges sitting on this court, they're not like, they're not trained top lawyers no. from each country. They, they, I mean, they're just sort of lay people. They're effectively, you know, sort of jury effectively. They have ruled that, yes, yeah. they do have a case. 
This is the first big climate victory in this European court. By the way, no appeal allowed. Mm. Um, the implications of this are huge. It's time to get out, is it not? I mean, for a start, given that it's Switzerland, if they are warming up, couldn't they just go higher up the mountain? It's not as if I mean, it's Switzerland well, is a famously you know, Mediterranean country. <laughs> um, honestly, though, it is another example, actually, of you know, your right to life, and we're going to interpret this as something yeah. to do with climate change, Trump's democracy. It, it flies in the face. Of, forget British values. It is actually fairly anti-European. The idea on which Europe was based, you know, all of these institutions just move further and further away from those ideals. We've already left one of them. Thank heavens for yep. that. Although we're not making the most of that because actually we you know, have no idea what to do and we're very poorly wrong. But absolutely, you know, if it wasn't just for the fact that we are no longer allowed to you know, police our own borders or decide what to do with people in this country, we also have to sort of listen to what people, as I say, you know, people in Switzerland, the famously neutral Switzerland that never takes a stance on anything, they've decided to take a stance on this one thing and we all have to go along with it. No, come along. Well, no, but it's not, it's not Switzerland that have done this. No, it's you? six people in yep. Switzerland. A oh, powerful lobby that is. No, so if they, if they were a little bit less neutral, maybe six people would have less of a sway, yeah. you would have thought. But, but it is extraordinary that these sort of court cases are brought. Now, the courts are supposed to uphold the laws. They're, mm. The point of these European courts and human rights was to protect people from governments when government was doing things to them. Mm. I mean, it, this, this I mean, far, apart from the fact this ruling is a massive big stretch of the court's mm. jurisdiction. Um, by the way, actually, warmer planet is better for human beings. More people, nine or ten times more people die every year from cold than from heat. Mm. So... Uh, so, so no, you're not at a higher risk of dying in, in a heat wave anyway. Um, so that that's not an issue. Um, but, but, but also, but just you know, again, assuming that the mm. assuming that the major assumption, I'm told, ooh, nine out of ten scientists, but there's no major assumption that the the the, the, the Swiss government mm. is able to do anything about global warming in the same way that we're not able to do anything mm. about global warming. I would argue because it's natural. The climate activists might argue it's because we need to be the leading country when it comes to uh, getting other human beings to, to tackle their moves. But the main thing about this is we've got we've got these sort of supernatural bodies. Mm. They are not they're not accountable. They're not elected. Mm. They're not democratic, and they're having a say over major policy fields for governments, oh, superseding nationally elected governments, parliaments, mm. and individuals in other European countries. Sorry. The time to go is now. Yes. Today, we're out of it. And it's mad that actually of all the countries, ours is the one that seems to take these bodies the most seriously. Most countries actually... Yeah, the Italians and the yeah. French just ignore well, it. Well, exactly. When they pass, when these courts sort of pass some, some sort of new regulation that says you have to do this, a lot of them go, OK, well, that works for us and that doesn't, so that's what we're going to yes. do. Yes. And they work out, oh, well, the fine is X amount. Yeah, well, our economy is going to make X amount if we don't do this, so we're happy to pay the fine if they ever do get around to doing yeah. that. It is nonsense. It's un undemocratic. The only thing that could sway me is if it's going to affect my skiing holidays, which given the Swiss, <laughs> yeah, I'm prepared to yeah. accept it might do. Am I having a you know, six inches shorter slope every year? That's, yeah, that's not, not, not something to laugh at, but nonetheless, well, broadly I'd that like shouldn't say, impact everyone else's I'd life. I'd like to it? say that uh, <laughs> my skiing holidays always, we keep constantly told there, there's not going to be any, I mean, a few years back we were told there'd be no snow in the Alps by this, by, mm. by this year. Um, I've had two, snow, two uh, days and days have been wiped out by too mm. much snow, so I'm not convinced You've by this. You've been skiing Let's, how many times this year? Don't, I mean, don't, <laughs> don't, my husband talked me into it, it's nothing to do with me. Too much um, snow. I, 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 I just do the drinking, people, I just do the drinking. I'm very good at the apre bit, rubbish at the pre bit. <laughs> um, and let's also talk about what's happening in, uh, in Gaza, because mm. we've been told by Benjamin Netanyahu, there is this date for this invasion of uh, of Rafa uh, to oust the nation, the last remaining, well, huge uh, mm -hmm. uh, brunt of the uh, the Hamas fighters. Um, in an interview that was recorded actually last week, but played uh, last night in American TV, which I, I do find quite bizarre, they waited that long. I don't think with a, a moving story like this, you can really do that. Um, but Benjamin Netanyahu has said that he believes so. Sorry, Biden admits that he thinks mm. Netanyahu is making a mistake in his policy. He's also called for an eight-week ceasefire to get aid into mm. uh, and food uh, and medicines into uh, Gaza. Um, there's been a massive change in the American attitude towards Israel over these, well, very much recent weeks, hasn't yeah. there? Well, there has, that's because obviously a lot of Biden's base, his new base, you know, traditionally the Democrats yeah. were actually very pro-Israel, increasingly they're not, and he's really beginning to feel the stress of that. But also, I think the Israelis have made it very clear to the Biden administration that they aren't going to stop. So what the, Isra what the Americans did instead was start to put pressure on Qatar and Egypt to put pressure on Hamas to release hostages. What has happened then is after doing that, the Israelis said, OK, we're going to pull back from uh, Gaza a little bit because we'd quite like the hostages back and we're prepared to deal with that. Hamas then came out and said, well, we can't actually guarantee that a lot of these people are alive. We don't know where a lot of them are. And the Israelis have gone, well, that's very much what we thought. And now we're going to go back in because, you know, obviously you don't have a chip to play with. You don't have a chip to yeah. bargain with. The, the prospect of an eight-week ceasefire 
isn't going to happen. A lot of aid has actually been getting into Gaza. The problem is it's not being distributed by the IDF for anybody who you'd think would be organised. Yeah. It's being distributed by NGOs and they work straight with local... I wouldn't even say Hamas. It's, you know, it, it's power figures you on can the get, ground. You, you first have to get it in, and then you, yeah. once you're in, you've got to actually distribute well, it to the people it goes, who need it. If it goes to a powerful family or a faction or something and they hoard it, and then, yeah. which is what happens in sieges, yeah. you shouldn't be surprised if it then doesn't get distributed very clearly. Actually, there has been a real pause. We've been talking about Rafa for months now and the yeah. Israelis have not gone in. I think patients is wearing thin and Hamas basically admitting look actually a lot of these people are not alive and we don't know where a lot of them are that's not a good sign and I think the Israelis have gone there is a diminishing chance of a lot of these people ever coming out alive. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that we, we, yeah, it's thought that at least 30 mm. are, are believed to be dead. Um, just finally, uh, in this section, I want to talk about the government announcing today the shoplifting crackdown uh, is including £55 million pounds for, for racial facial recognition tools in England and Wales, um, a more sort of high-tech tagging as well, uh, forcing people to well, stop them revisiting the scene of their crime, people mm. facing up to six months and receiving unlimited fines uh, if they uh, do actually uh, carry on shoplifting. Um, I have to say, what a load of absolute, what's the word I can use on air? Rub it, let's go with rub it, let's go with the safe one. All the production team look at me go, don't do it, don't, you know the word I'm thinking of and it begins with a B and ends in an S. What a load of absolute nonsense this is. I mean, it, it's not a question of identifying shoplifters to mm. stop shoplifters. It's not a question of like, oh, can we stop them going to the shops again? I'm sorry, they, the shopkeepers, I speak to everyone on my local high street. Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. Um, they know who they are. Mm -hmm. It's the same people day after day. Mm -hmm. The police know who they are. Mm -hmm. They don't bother arresting them because they know they're going to send them to court. They get another slap on the wrist. They're not going to be able to pay a fine. And they're not because they haven't got any money. Uh, they're organised gags. They're all going mm -hmm. to just disappear. And they are, they are, they're going to never be sent to prison. Why? Because we haven't got enough prison places. This is an absolute lie. This uh, crackdown. An absolute lie. There's something else actually to do with the facial recognition technology and why it doesn't actually work at the moment. And that's because ever since the this government decided it would be a really good thing to mandate that people had to wear masks in public. People yeah. now have a lot of masks, and a lot of people wear masks when they're committing crimes. And I've been told this by a police yeah. officer, even though we know 50 so people in the area that are, you know, the criminals, they're the, they're the thieves, we can't necessarily narrow it down beyond the 50 because they all come from certain backgrounds and they're wearing masks. And actually, the technology is not perfect. It does get the number And of, then we yeah. get in trouble if we nick yeah. the wrong person. The number of young men, young, yes. slim men, who, by the way, were the people who were not wearing masks mm. when we were required to wear masks, yeah. when I was told I'd be sacked if I didn't wear a mask on the train mm -hmm. and things. Funnily enough, all wearing masks in the open air. Mm -hmm. Isn't that weird? I yeah. wonder why they're doing Often that. Often whilst they're cycling down the streets, you notice. You, know, yeah, you think, oh, the odds of you getting COVID whilst you're... I mean, I'm sorry. It does, it, that's it, where you catch it, on the us, road. I mean, come on, guys, we all know what's going on. It is extraordinary, isn't it? it just, I mean, sorry. It's when ministers announce this stuff. Mm. It's like, if you haven't got any prison places to put these people in and, and no one's actually being charged, please just stop lying to us. We know what is happening on our local high streets. Uh, right, um, loads more to talk about. Loads more with Benedict Spence, but I want to hear from you as well. I've been asking you today about this uh, CASA report, this landmark review into treatment uh, for children who believe they are trans uh, and uh, basically it said they should not be given puberty blockers. They say thousands of youngsters have been let down by the NHS. I want to know what your reaction is. You can give us a call 0344 499 1000. Text on 8722 or you can get us in touch on X at Talk TV and you've been doing just that. Let's get some of your messages. Uh, Lincoln has got in touch to say children don't know if they want an Xbox or a PS so they really haven't a clue about gender or what side they're batting for. Time to start having a chat with their woke parents. Hear, hear to that. You, it's always a certain kind of parent, is it not? Um, Luke says, one can't imagine why anyone thought this was a good idea in the first place. Jeff says, medical negligence by the bucket load. When will these doctors face the consequences? We'll hear, hear to that. And Meadow says, giving children puberty blockers is child abuse absolutely agree with you on that uh, well let's go to the phone lines as well and on the line is sarah who is in kent hello sarah hello julia hello thanks so much for getting in touch what do you want to say i just wanted to completely agree with you about this whole trans thing with children it is shocking i can't believe parents who should be parenting children are letting their children go through with this sort of treatment yeah. that must be costing the end the taxpayer let's face it an absolute mm -hmm. fortune, and in years to come, they will regret it, and they will expect the NHS to reverse it. Well, they, we'll which they can't. Parents need to be parents. Children should not be allowed 
to go through with this sort of thing without some sort of parental guidance. And I can't even believe the doctor's going through with this. No, well, I mean, I, it's, I mean, it's absolutely criminal what the doctors have done. I know, I know parents, though, I've spoken to lots of parents who've, who've gone through this, they say they are basically blackmailed by the doctors and the clinics and by their own children saying, well, you know, they're just better to have a trans child than have a dead child. I mean, they're literally told that. It's an absolute lie, actually, by the way, because post-op and post-treatment, actually, there's a higher rate of children taking their own lives. But often these children are, you know, they're unhappy children. They, 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 they've either suffered abuse of some sort, some sort of trauma, or really sad, the worst, the saddest things often. They're, they're, they're often, in the case of girls, they're often just young lesbians. You know, and for some reason they think there's something wrong with being gay. Well, you know, that's an issue of the family because they should have made it clear to them that that's not an issue. Yeah, but the other thing is you, everyone is too frightened to speak out on these issues because of being called, a you know, you're some horrible person, you're against trans people. Yeah. You, need to be, you need to speak common sense to children. Children need to understand... They, they should not be allowed to make these massive decisions. Exactly. It's just ridiculous. I completely agree with you. And again, I think the parents in a lot of cases have got a lot to answer for, and indeed the schools as well. A big issue over social transition we'll talk about a little bit later. Well, up next, we're going to talk to the fabulous, the wonderful uh, Maya Forstetter uh, from Sex Matters about all of this. Plenty more coming up as well. Let's take a break. This is Talk TV. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good morning to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. This is Talk TV with me, Julia Hartley Brewer. Still with me in the studio is a Benedict Spencer. If you're just wondering which studio we're in, if you're watching on the telly box, here we are in a different studio, back at the old radio studio, where it will soon be uh, very, very, very soon. And 
delighted to be here, I have to say. Uh, uh, delighted also to welcome my next guest to talk about the CAS uh, review into NHS treatment of children who believe they are trans. And that is Maya Forstatter, who's Executive Director uh, of Sex Matters, the fantastic human rights charity that promotes, well, clarity about what they say, sex in law, policy and language in order to protect everyone's rights. And you've been doing that magnificently over the years. Maya, thank you for joining us. Hello, Julia. Um, I'm sure you, like me, you know, we saw a lot of the previews of what was going to be in the cash review. We had that interim report uh, a, a year or so ago. Um, welcome, well, pretty much everything that's in that cash report, don't you? Absolutely. Uh, it, it's a watershed report and, and it says everything that, you know, you know and I know and the whistleblowers from the Tavistock have known for years and years, but it hasn't got out into the media and into the yeah. mainstream. Uh, and Hillary Cass put it all there with research, uh, with all the backing, um, and nobody can ignore that this is what's happened now. And that's the thing. Even the BBC that, uh, you know, that has been... I mean, I'm sorry, if you've got a kid and you don't realise that the trans stuff that's being pushed by the BBC on all their various websites and stuff aimed at kids, you, you know, you need to take a look, guys. Um, but this is the thing. There was... Reading it this morning and reading, uh, you know, all the summaries of it and going... There wasn't anything in it that I didn't already know. And I, I'm not an expert in, in uh, transgender medical care. You're not an expert in transgender medical care. So how can we know it? And for some reason, the medics didn't know. We knew that there was no evidence for a lot of these puberty blocker treatments. Uh, we knew that there was no evidence, for instance, that treating children earlier um, uh, would, would help with their outcomes. We knew there was no evidence, no follow-ups in terms of long-term uh, impacts. Uh, we, we, knew, we, knew, uh, we knew absolutely that a lot of the children that were going to uh, seek uh, transgender care had been the victims of abuse, trauma, neglect. We know that many had a huge number, a huge percentage had autism uh, we knew many others had other mental health issues we knew also an awful lot of the girls and the massive explosion from a few dozen to thousands of teenage girls thinking that they were transgender with this social contagion and youtube videos telling girls oh i bind my breasts and now i'm happy again that sort of nonsense we knew that a lot of those girls were actually just gay nothing wrong with being gay no one seems to have told them there was nothing wrong with being gay and they thought therefore they were a girl in a a, a boy in a girl's body um if we knew all of that, how did the medics at the Tavistock clinic, the main transgender clinic for kids, how did they not know that and why did they ignore it for so many years? I think many of them did know it. The leadership at the Tavistock did know it. Um, they, they couldn't have not known it. One, once the whistleblowers started speaking up, I mean, they were yeah. seeing it in front of them. Um, I think other, you know, it wasn't being researched in universities it wasn't being published in peer review studies so other people were saying oh well this is just you know this is just some transphobe saying this yeah. um and you know the things that are in the cas report some of them are things that were investigated by uh, michael biggs and by transgender trend you know organizations mm -hmm. that were um really going against mainstream opinion and having to be quite brave to do it because none of the researchers would, were doing this. Um, so the thing that Cass did, one, she was commissioned by the government to do this, and two, she then commissioned uh, York University uh, and other u researchers to look at across all of the evidence so that they could say, not just that we know and we feel that this is wrong, but looking at the evidence, we know that there is no evidence that this yeah. um, helps children. And we know that it harms them because the way that the drugs work is to sterilize um, and uh, remove sexual function. I mean, that, yeah. that's that's it working in the way that it's, it's intended to. Yeah. Um, so she's put all of that down in black and white in a format that people can trust and people can't ignore anymore. And, and she has the credential. She's a paediatrician herself and a, a former president of the Royal College of uh, Paediatrics and uh, Child Health. I mean, she, 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 she is an expert in, in this field and understands it. But this is the thing I find amazing is these were always experimental drugs. These are, a lot of these drugs are the drugs they've used to castrate sex offenders, for goodness sake. You know, well, yeah, let's give those to kids. That seems like a good idea. Now, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of those mums who's, you know, you don't give Calpol unless you need to. Like, well, I can give you a paracetamol, but only half a paracetamol. The advice we're given in terms of being careful for, you know, children's care is huge in terms of, you know, in terms of vaccines, in terms of any sort of treatment, because we know that the bodies of children are, they're, they're, they're changing and uh, they're still developing. The impact on the brain, impact on, you know, organs like the liver and other others, that, you know, that you have to take extra care. It is extraordinary to me that 
so much research and so much experimentation has to be signed off for any other drug for children. And yet these were experimental drugs. There was no proof they were safe. There was no proof that they did good. And yet they were given to thousands upon thousands of children, not just here, but around uh, the world as well. Um, why, why, was, why was an exception made for these drugs? They weren't life-saving. No, absolutely. And I mean, what happened was that the Tavistock originally had a contract and a protocol for to use these drugs as an experiment. I mean, every experiment has to start somewhere. And there had been this very small experiment in the Netherlands and the Tavistock was given the um, go ahead to prescribe these drugs to the same kinds of children who had been prescribed the drugs in the Netherlands. So children who were very gender non-conforming from, from a very early age, who had um, uh, were, were a known group, but and and those were mainly boys. Uh, and But what they quickly did was expand that group and suddenly it was mainly girls, it was teenagers, it was children who hadn't been gender non-conforming non where you know this had come out of nowhere and so they they expanded it from being an experiment with the, that was supposed to be focused on a very small tight group of children and plus they didn't run it as an experiment they yeah. didn't follow up they didn't collect the data so it was it wasn't even an experiment it was just an uncontrolled yeah. uh testing of, of or not even testing but just uncontrolled giving of these these drugs to children i mean i mean know and we know the issue and this was raised you know with kira bell's case in the high court and and a lot of the tavistock people who ended up resigning because they couldn't bear it working in this field anymore and, and whistleblowers you say spoke out that you know children couldn't possibly consent to this treatment and have a full understanding of the implications in terms of their long-term health in terms of their body is being mutilated in terms of their brain function being affected as you say being rendered sterile uh, uh, being unable to ever enjoy, you know, sexual orgasm. I'm sorry, you know, people don't want to talk about that with kids. But how on earth, at the age of 14, can you consent to that? You don't know. If you're if you're a 25 year old and you go to your doctor and you say, um, I'd like to be, I'd like to be sterilised. I don't want kids. They won't do it because, well, you might change your mind in your 30s. And, and yet, no, no, 14, not a problem. And parents being forced to go down this route. And the thing is, the whole way through, the parents who spoke out on this were called bigots. You and I were called bigots. Everyone else who spoke out, we're all terrible, awful people. Um, we've been proved right in, in our concerns. Um, hopefully this will stop, although private clinics still handing out puberty blockers. NHS Scotland still handing out puberty blockers. I mean, the government today should ban puberty blockers for under 18s. Full stop, done. You hand those out, you're committing a criminal offence. But do you think that we need to go further than this? Do we need to have doctors struck off, losing their medical licence? Do we need to have criminal charges brought? I do think there needs to be an inquiry into what went wrong and it, it you know it's not just doctors it's nhs decision makers it's it's politicians it, you know it's not it's not just about individual doctors it's how how did this go wrong um I, it, the the cast report is about how to fix it but we do have to have an inquiry yeah and we've still got the issue of social transitioning in schools. We're seeing reports at the weekend, even primary schools allowing, you know, little Jane to go in and say, I think I'm a boy, could he call me John? He and him pronouns. Parents discover when they turn up, you know, to a concert and, and, and little Jane is, uh, is playing Joseph in the school playing things, uh, thinks her name is John and she's a boy. And the teachers have been playing along with it. Now, that's got to stop. And again, something that was in the report uh, from Hilary Cass is, is saying that actually, you know, there's no evidence that this idea of socially, socially transitioning kids helps them in any way. Uh, absolutely. And Hilary Cass was just looking at these children who were on the waiting list for the Tavistock. She wasn't thinking about the other children in school. Yeah. So even just looking at those children, she said there's no good evidence that social transition helps. Yeah. Once you start thinking about the other children and you say, well, those children have rights too, and they have rights to, uh, you know, toilets and changing rooms and sports. And, and to not be forced to lie. Absolutely. It's a fairly really fundamental right, that. It, once, once you say that, it just seems obvious that there's no ethical and safe way that you can transition any child in school, even if the doctors thought it was good for that individual child. But also, again, I liken this always to anorexia. If an incredibly painfully uh, medically skinny child came to me and said, I believe I'm really grossly overweight because I have got this mental health problem of being anorexic, but I believe I'm deeply, massively overweight and I need to lose weight. Will you help me? 
I wouldn't help them to lose weight because that would be wrong. And so why are we telling children, yes, you think you're born in the wrong body. There is no such thing as being born in the wrong body. There is no such thing as a boy being born in a girl's body or a girl born in a boy's body. It's not a thing. It's not real. Go out to play should be the response. Absolutely. And schools need to be telling children that. That that was the one thing Cass didn't really look at with school. She looked at social yeah. media. She looked at peers. Uh, but now this is being taught in schools and that is causing harm. Absolutely. Really appreciate you coming on the show, but even more so, Maya, I appreciate the hard work you've done. You know, you lost a job and fought a battle on this in relation to women's rights, but this is this stretches across the board in society, and it's, it's about reality, and it's about truth, and it's about our children's safety. Thank you for everything you've done. I know you'll be a hero to many of my audience. Maya Forrester, the Executive Director of Sex Matters. Um, let me go to a caller now. Um, um, Ellen has got in touch. She's in Durham and joins us. Hello, Ellen. Hello there, Julia. Hello. Um, thank you for thank you for for talking to me. Yeah, um, I really think. I mean, it's very disconcerting. All of this, it really is. Um, when when I've, I'm 50 odd years old now, and and I've I've grown up in dressing in male's clothes, apart from my school uniform, dressing up in male's clothes. Yeah. Uh, my wardrobe is completely male. There's very little um, uh, female stuff there, if, if any. Um, but I was allowed to grow up. My my mum, bless her, she tried the little white dresses, the pretty little suit. <laughs> but, but bless her, you know, um, she allowed me to be me. And there was none of this when, when, when I grew up, um, yeah. you know. And I always used to joke that I'm 51% male and 49%. Yeah. So do, do you believe do you believe you are you are really male? You, do, oh, you, no, do, no, no, you know, you're a woman. You just yeah, like men's I, clothes. Yeah, I'm a, I'm the, my problem is is today, not not yesterday. I was allowed to grow up, be a happy child. Yep. I was allowed to do men's, but I mean, my school. I have to say, you know, they allowed me to play men's uh, lad sports along with the lads. Yeah. You know, um, and and nobody really bothered. And um, and like I say, I'm a heterosexual woman. Yep. I, my my problem is now with people telling me that I'm because of all of this, telling me I'm gay, yep. telling me that I need to come out, telling me I need to be me, telling me that I'm bi, telling me I'm in the wrong time. Well, you're and trans, I, and, yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I, you're I'm, just I'm a, you. Yeah, I, well, but this is this is. Ex I mean, anybody who knows me, you know, um, just just laugh it, it. They just laugh it off, you know. Yeah. And but. But I, I kind of I feel for a lot of young lasses who just want to be themselves, whether they're yep. gay, female, or feel like they want to be young yep. lads. Let them have a chance to grow up and absolutely like, later age. But 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 also again, you get like really girly girls and you get sort of tomboys. But it doesn't change your gender or your sexuality or anything like that. Ellen, good for you. Even more so. Good for your mum, I have to say. Really quick word for Benedict Spence. I think that what well, this will require now is leadership, and I fear that ultimately you will see a lot of teachers and doctors doubling down, because how on earth do you turn around and say, yes, I allowed this sort of thing to happen I've and I was wrong? I've been wrong all along. Yeah, I suspect that this will take a lot of hard work to well, root it out of schools well, and, and the absolutely. medical profession. Well, again, we are going to have to start taking people to, uh, to court and yeah. we're going to have to start uh, uh, sacking people because it's going to have to be a really clear message, isn't it? Thank you very much indeed there, Benedict Spence. 10.46 is the time. This is Talk. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right to. Yeah. Quite yeah. right to. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on, what just <laughs> happened? <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> 
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Julia Hartley-Brew. This is Talk TV. The time is uh, coming up to 10.50. Uh, let's talk right now about, oh, crackdown on shoplifting. Oh, yeah, and those Champions League matches with the terror threats. Let's talk to Chris Phillips. He is the former head of the National Counter-Terrorism Security Office and a former police officer of 30 years. Good morning to you, Chris. Good morning, Julia. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I just want to go briefly over the, the Champions League and their terror threats. I mean, I would say my daughter was watching one of the matches in a pub nearby and I was like, I just want to double check that you know that there's a terror threat because if they can't get into the stadium. We know local transport hubs and pubs might be a target. Keep your wits about you. Got the usual rolled eyes, obviously, as you would expect. But how serious was this terror threat last night? Well, I think it's uh, ISIS just trying to have a bit of a call to arms. Uh, it's obviously had the attack in Moscow and it feels that uh, it needs to remind the West that they're still there. And, um, of course, it's, this is also a, a, a bit of a, a, a good side for policing and, and security services because they wouldn't actually announce that they're going to attack a, a location. They would just do it. Uh, this is more a case of them saying, listen, we can't attack you with our, with our armed teams, but what we want uh, is local people uh, to come up and, yeah. and support ISIS and do it. So yeah. so I think it's uh, we've got to be careful we don't give this too much publicity, but no. um, it is always a concern when you get these threats. No, indeed. And as you say, they don't normally give us a warning about it. There might be some chatter online in in, uh, in forums, but, uh, but not an actual warning. But again, putting out pictures of the stadium, and we know, as we've seen, you don't need to be sophisticated terror cell that's been uh, plotting for years or have bombs. We know that, you know, cars and, and knives have been used uh, uh, to, to, to take, take a huge amount of life in recent years in this country and uh, across Europe as well. But uh, as I say, it is a concern for people. Let's talk about, well, I suppose it's a lesser crime. I and mean, of course it is a lesser crime, but it is a crime that blights our local communities and our local high streets, and that is shoplifting. The government's announced a crackdown today uh, on shoplifting, including, they say, £55 million for facial recognition tools. My God, let's get some more tech involved, shall we? They also say more high-tech tagging of prolific offenders to stop them going into the stores uh, where they have been uh, 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 stealing from, uh, and also chances of uh, fines and going to prison. Um, I have to say, I, I saw this story this morning and I thought, what a load of balderdash. Is any of this ever remotely going to happen and make a single difference? No, uh, basically not. The, the, it's interesting. I've done a lot of work over the last couple of years with shopping centres and stadiums, and but, but particularly around town centres. Uh, and the, the shopping shops are just losing hand over fist. Uh, and it's caused by a number of things. It's caused by police officers being taken away from the high streets from patrolling, from foot patrolling, police stations being moved uh, 20, 30 miles away. 
Uh, and, uh, of course, the shops are, are very unable, really, to deal with shoplifters. And sometimes unwilling, to be quite frank, as well. You know, they, they won't do the simple things to, to make things better. Uh, but, well, I mean, like, I well, like what? Because I've spoken to the local security guards and the managers of the local high street stores when they were saying to me, like, this is a nightmare. You know, we know who's, we know who's coming. Often it's organised gangs. We put some particular items out. You know, we've got a guard right next to them. They come in, three or four of them. They, you know, they get it. it. Our guard is being told, you know, look, you know, you're, you know, you're freelance. You get injured tackling these people. You're not going to get paid. It's not, they're on minimum wage. With all due respect, you know they're not they're not willing to risk their life uh, for you know for some makeup being stolen in the local uh, in the local chemist. I mean, you know, but but I've been told you know by, again and again by shopkeeper after shopkeeper, these people are just coming in, they're acting with impunity. Everyone knows who they are. They give the identity to the police, and the police don't do anything. And even if the police do do something, these people go to court. They get a slap on the wrist. You know, and I know, we've got a couple of hundred places max left in the prison system. They ain't sending a prolific shoplifter to jail when they're not sending somebody, putting someone on remand who been in the news lately, who've made threats to kill. No, and that, they're not frightened of the law. I mean, that's yeah. as simple as that. I think probably when we were growing up, you would be quite uh, scared of being arrested by the police or, or uh, you know, even as being someone, caught. As yeah. someone who was arrested for shoplifting at the <laughs> age of 15, who had there nightmares about that hand... Um, this, is the, this is the sort it of... Wasn't what me too, I'm yeah. not joking, Chris. First... Everyone I knew did it. First time I did it. I'm rubbish at crime. Do I don't commit crime? I can still remember, I will still to this day have nightmares about that hand on my shoulder and sitting in that police cell and that talking to from a senior police officer frightened the living daylights out of me. I walk around stores holding things like this. I'm not shoplifting. I'm not shoplifting. I mean, but, you know, most people will be horrified by that. I was a kid. I, you know, I, I, I got the slap on the wrist and I learnt my lesson. But that is not what's happening now. No, it's not what's happening. But, I, I, I mean, it was quite interesting because I had a, a conversation with a, a police crime commissioner who was basically victim-blaming and saying, look, it's awful. It's, it's clearly not. It's, it's the fact that we have, over the last 20 years, taken our policing away from, uh, yeah. from the high streets. Uh, we've given the, the criminals a free run. Uh, you know, to some extent, um, shops have, you know, and I, I know this for a fact, shops have reduced staff to the absolute yeah. minimum uh, and, you know, my piece of advice was to put someone actually on the door to stop people walking out with trays of meat and bags yeah. of meat. And, and they weren't willing to do that yeah. because well, they didn't see the benefit. So so stores need to do a little bit more as well. But but they are the victims in this, let's be quite frank. And we have to get back to a situation where people are frightened of committing crime. Yeah, I, this is a mind-blowing idea, Chris. <laughs> exactly. Chris Phillips, always so good to talk to you. Voice of reason, as always. Thank you very much indeed. Benedict Spence has been shoplifted. grinning at me. I shoplifted once. So did I. I was, did you? I was rubbish at it. <laughs> I was three. It's one of my earliest memories. You pick, shoplifted Pick a mix and Woolworth. Did you get, oh, everyone, didn't everyone do that? I was caught. <laughs> I but was it, not it's a terrible. No, it's a terrible. We shouldn't joke about it because Jamie, these, I mean, these high street stores that they are losing, like they're they're losing their profits to the shoplifters. Lots of people like me. Was, well, well, worse is gone. Well, 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 you see, you're uh, yeah, responsible sorry. for Woolies closing down. I did Benedict. something dreadful. But we but do you're need. Right. We do need to get to a point where people are scared. And you're right. It put the fear of God in me, as you can imagine, a three-year-old. And I imagine actually that is a lot of what it is. There's just no deterrence for anymore. There really there? isn't. There really isn't. Absolutely not. Well, look. Thank you very much. More from Benedict Spence. Lots more top guests are to come, including Benedict Spence. Do we count him as a top guest? Uh, and more of me as well. Uh, this is Talk TV. Let's get the latest news headlines right now with our newsreader, Divya Coney. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Quite right too. It's that time again to get the violins out.
That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Talk TV and radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Harley Brewer and you're with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. You knew that already. And we're here live from 10 until 1. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to talk more about the landmark cast review into the NHS Transgender Services for Children, which says the evidence for allowing kids to change gender is based on remarkably weak evidence uh, and calls for an end to rushing children into treatment and a ban on puberty blockers for all under 18s. And a Welsh government report has extraordinarily suggested that the four-day working week could be racist against ethnic groups who work in the public sector that operate seven days a week. We'll find out why. And there are renewed calls to the UK to leave the European Court of Human Rights. This after the court issued a landmark ruling yesterday that says governments have a duty to protect their citizens from the impact of climate change. Of of course they said that. We'll be talking about all of that, plenty more besides. First though, let's get the latest news headlines for Divya Coley. This is Talk TV News. Good morning. A major review into gender services is calling for a more cautious approach to children who are confused about their sex. It found children have been let down by a lack of evidence on medical interventions in gender care. The review, led by Dr Hilary Cass, is calling for a more holistic approach to the services, especially for children with mental health needs. Cass says the young people who are presenting to gender services are very different to those they saw 10 years ago. So the original cohort of young people was really predominantly children and predominantly birth registered boys and now the predominant group is birth registered girls presenting in early teens uh, and the other significant change has been the numbers have gone up dramatically from less than 50 a year to now um, um, more than 3,000 a year. The Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has defended the decision not to stop arming Israel, saying none of our closest allies have done so. The Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron made the announcement on his US visit amid growing pressure over the government's weapons trade with Israel following an airstrike which killed aid workers and the ever-increasing humanitarian crisis in Gaza. 
The Prime Minister has launched a fresh crackdown on retail crime with violence against shop workers to be made a specific criminal offence. Persistent shoplifters could also be forced to wear tags. Victims and safeguarding Minister Laura Farris has suggested shoplifting is by and large linked to organised crime rather than the cost of living. This shopkeeper in London told us it's hard to see how these measures will be implemented. Shoplifting has almost been decriminalised and it was out of control. We had so many staff leave uh, the job. Um, they're threatened uh, with violence and abuse. So this is a step in the right direction, but I'm not entirely sure how they're going to implement it. We have existing laws, we have existing legislation, but if the prisons are full and they're threatening uh, to put uh, offenders who uh, attack shop staff into jail, then where is this space going to come from? Meanwhile, 7.4 million adults are struggling to pay their bills due to the cost of living crisis. That's according to a new survey by the Financial Conduct Authority, which found one in nine adults had missed a bill in the six months to January. The same proportion of people had no disposable income. Despite slowing inflation, energy bills and food prices remain much higher than they were a few years ago. The U.S. state of Arizona has reinstated a near-total abortion ban. The laws which were abolished 160 years ago have been brought back, which could make abortion punishable by up to five years in prison unless a mother's life is at risk. And it could see clinics shut down across the state. It comes two years after the historic overturning of the Roe versus Wade legislation. Arizona's governor says she's going to fight what she calls extremist county prosecutors who brought it in. I'm devastated by this decision, and I know that many Arizonas, Arizonans are as well. We are 14 days away from this extreme ban coming back to life. It must be repealed. And another Bridget Jones film is in the pipeline. A fourth movie will see Rene Zellweger, Hugh Grant and Emma Thompson all reprise their roles. It's called Bridget Jones Mad About the Boy and is set to be released on Valentine's Day next year. That's the latest Weather Time Now with Nazneen Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, a chilly but sunny start across many parts of Britain this morning, but rain already across the west will be steadily moving eastwards through this afternoon. Some heavy downpours, especially for western parts of Scotland where there's a warning for the rain from the Met Office, valid until 10pm as flooding issues are possible there. The rain most persistent across Scotland, patchy in nature across England, Wales and Northern Ireland, reaching eastern England by the end of today. But it is feeling mild compared to recently, temperatures up to around 14 degrees Celsius. And it stays mild over night, noticeably so compared to last night, but cloudy and wet conditions continue to move eastwards and southwards as the cold front moves rain across northern and western parts of England and Wales. Further south and east, it will be murky, but I think mostly dry there and becoming drier for Northern Ireland, but wet everywhere else. And then through tomorrow, we'll continue to see the rain clear away eastwards and southwards. That cold front, though, lingering along the south coast, so quite a cloudy, damp and dull day there, as well as feeling cool. But everywhere else, some good spells of sunshine, brighter conditions and mainly dry and also feeling fairly mild with temperatures up to around 16 to 17 degrees Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. This is Talk on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And joining me still in the studio is Benedict Spence, who's Conservative commentator. Good morning to you once again. Good morning. There's no doubt at all what the biggest story in town is today, and it is uh, the cash review into trans services uh, for children. And absolutely, I mean, unbelievably unshocking reading it is, because mm. there's nothing in this cash review that I didn't already know. And mm. funnily enough, I'm not a medical, as, as has often been pointed out to me, I'm not a medical expert mm. uh, on this field. And yet I knew everything that she has pointed out. Uh, the paediatrician, Hilary Cass, uh, a former president of the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health. I don't know. 
may know something about the treatment of children. Let's go out there on a limb, guys. Uh, she says uh, that the evidence for the treatment of children with puberty blockers and the like for, for believing they are trans is weak and based on shaky foundations and no good evidence of long-term outcomes. Not that anyone was even looking for it. They didn't bother. Uh, she's called for uh, much more uh, care to be taken with anyone under the age of 25. End to all puberty blocking hormone drugs for under 18s, although they are still available in private clinics and in the NHS in Scotland. Uh, and pointed out that many who do believe that they're trans have experienced trauma, neglect, abuse. Uh, many have autism, other mental health problems. And also, an awful lot of the girls are just simply gay. Uh, they're not born in a boy's, in a girl in a boy's body or a boy in a girl's body. They're just simply gay. Uh, she's suggested more holistic therapeutic support uh, for children. Basically, not treating them as if their only issue is that they are trans. Because there is no such thing, remember, as a trans child. Uh, but she also said there was really no clear evidence that social transitioning, this idea of saying, well, yes, I'll agree to call you by an opposite gender name and different pronouns, um, will help help or indeed uh, hinder those children. It's four years. It's a 388-page report. Um, Benedict Spence, um, it's great that this report is out. Will it change anything? Well, that's the big question. It'll require, I think, sort of root and branch action, and it will require action by government, actually, to do this, because, of course, the incoming government has an even worse sort of stance than the Labour, actual government. Assuming Labour win. Well, yes, yeah. let's assume that Labour win. Yeah. Um, that It's going to require, and I know that, you know, not everybody in the Labour Party actually is of the same view as this. There have been some very brave, I think, Rosie Duffield and others have, uh, have actually sort of taken a stand amongst uh, against some real vitriol, uh, actually, uh, in the party. I'd be interested to hear what we're treating the future, likely future health secretary is going to say about this report and if it's going to be implemented. But that's the key thing. This stuff was known. It's now out there, pretty much in black and white. There's no getting away from it. Mm -hmm. Will we see this actually being acted upon? Will we see people who pushed this ideology uh, being brought to task and in certain cases potentially dismissed? Um, is that going to happen? And ultimately, I also want to know what are the safeguards going to be against the next mimetic social contagion that's going to affect our children? Because exactly. this is not the first thing, be it you know eating disorders, yep. be it self harm, you know, of course, which all of these are a form of self harm. How are we going to stop the next thing? It's yeah. all very well saying years after the fact we finally determined that this well, is the science. Well, now move on to the What's next, the next one. And this is what we know: we know that traumatized children, that children mm. who are neglected, children who are abused, children who uh, who. I mean, so we've all we, when we were a kid, we all knew these kids. The kids are just unhappy in themselves, mm. you know. And that these children, you know, they are very, very vulnerable to be victims to this sort of thing. And we know that that happens. Mm. And yet, oh, let's just happen. Let it happen. The next thing. Like, what amazes me is that, you know. With children with eating disorders, and we've all known either friends or family members or, mm. or our friends, children with eating disorders, you don't go around to a child that believes that they are desperately, desperately fat when actually they're desperately, desperately unhealthily thin, mm. possibly even, you know, could die as a result of lack of malnutrition. And when they say, I'm, a, I'm really, really fat, I need your help to mm. help me diet more, we don't help them. We don't. We don't affirm that and say yeah. yes. That's yes. You are. And yet on the trans issue, yes, you are born in the wrong body. No one is born in the wrong body. That's mm. one of my phrases now. Not a thing. Yeah, because this is the dangerous part where it begins to cross over from simply being self harm to being about ideology and personhood. Yeah. Identity has become such a self consuming yeah. thing in the United Kingdom, which is bizarre because United it didn't. Use, but that's where it comes from. That's the point. It's because we are downstream of culture in the United States. A lot of this stuff is being imported. And you see this when it comes to racism, when it comes to yeah. uh, when it comes to religious background. Suddenly, this is important. Suddenly, this is a thing. When you take a simple question of very unhappy, very vulnerable people, and you apply apply self-harm and then you put a sprinkling of identity into it yep. it becomes an incredibly and, toxic thing. and when you medicalize it and look yeah. at it, it's interesting you know how slow the organizations like stonewall um and uh, and mermaids and others uh, have been isn't mm. it? it's really interesting in they, they, yeah. they've given responses today and they're kind of mixed and it's, i find it's fascinating even like the bbc's response today you know so people like me who they would have regarded as mm. bigots i would say i lost a lot i'm perfectly happy to lose work for giving my views because i'm never mm. going to stop giving my views uh, people say, oh, yeah, you, you, you get paid to say things about Israel. Or, you know, I don't. I just get paid to give my honestly held opinions. Mm. I, I lost a load of work from being a Brexiteer. Fine. Stand by that forever. Mm. I lost a load of work post-lockdown for having been, well, apparently, you know, uh, COVID deny and all mm. of this absolute nonsense. The most work I've lost is over standing up on the trans issue. Never, like J.K. Rowling and Maya Forstett and everyone, never uttered a word in in, in hatred mm. or, or, or any way of anyone who is trans, but simply wanted to protect people who are being exploited and mm. medicalised, and I would say mutilated and brutalised by, mm. by this, this this political ideology. Um, and that's the thing. And it, and it is 
people like, I mean, like the BBC who refused to ever have Helen Joyce on about mm -hmm. her book, Trans, which has been a game changer book for a lot of people. It is absolutely extraordinary. Oh, very quickly changing their tune when one of them writes a book about mm. it and exposes what is really going on. I mean, mm. I'm sorry, these people disgust me. I was going to say, it's, it's front page of the Guardian today, which must be very interesting in that newsroom, given some of the conversations that have been happening And the number there. of women who've been forced out of jobs there because they refuse to have the Absolutely. erasure of women on this one. But it's interesting, one of the things, that, in fact, the only thing I disagree with Hilary Cass, the, the author mm. of this report on, is that she talked about how the toxicity, toxicity of the debate is exceptional, how this prevented mm. people particularly in the Tavistock clinic that was treating children to sort of coming forward and, and it present, you know, uh, prevented problems. Mm. They, it was never a toxic debate. Yeah. It was toxic on one side. People who've been trying to protect mm. the whistleblowers, the medics speaking out, the therapists speaking out, the, the campaigners, the parents, desperately trying to mm. protect children from this absolute medical scandal yeah. have not been shouting abuse at people the people who have criticised us, though, we are, you know, we're bigots, we're transphobes, we're bait, we're, we're child killers. Mm. That is, I think, a quirk of our liberal democracy, which is that when there is one side that is very vociferous and aggressive towards the other, in order to slightly placate that side, whoever to, is arbitrating yeah. has to go, everybody calm down. You see this, of course, with the Israel-Gaza uh, marches as well. Yeah. It's always, everybody has yeah. to be very calm, even though it's only one side that's calling yeah, exactly. the genocide. Is that, you have to do that. Like almost two like naughty children, and one of them's just battering the other one, and parents come in yeah. and punish them both and it's like no sorry Hilary Cass no, my side mm. hasn't been toxic we've been trying to save children's lives sorry mm. call, call me old-fashioned on that front um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this I kind of know what a lot of them are because you're far too sensible to have different views but you're welcome to have different views if you want to call in you want to tell us uh, you completely disagree with the cash review or your concerns about it I'd love to hear your thoughts as well but do get in touch what is your reaction to that review give us a call 0344 499 1000 text 87 treble so you can get in touch on x at talk uh, tv as well uh, don't forget calls are charged at the national rate text cost one standard network rate message um we're going to get a call up uh, in just a few moments and look at I've got a lot more text coming in but I also want to ask you about the European Court of Human Rights uh, an extraordinary ruling, a climate ruling. A bunch of elderly women in their 70s in Switzerland took a case to the European Court of Human Rights, Strasbourg, um, where they, and they are basically saying, we're, we're elderly women, we're more at risk of heat waves and the failure of the Swiss government to match their uh, net zero uh, carbon you know, decarbonisation mm. targets means that we're at risk of dying as a result of this. We have a human right to be protected from this. And astonishingly, instead of being told, oh, do sod off, mm. <laughs> so no offence, get back to your crochet. Um, <laughs> What is it they I know do that's what women in their seventies do. Get back, <laughs> get back to your yodeling. Get back to whatever it is you do. But no, what a load of nonsense! You don't have, you don't have a right to be a human right to be protected from mm. climate change, uh, which is natural, by the way. Oh, hi, Ofcom. Um, uh, but uh, extraordinarily, um, they won that case. Um, mm. We need to leave the European Court of Human Rights. This is a binding uh, court decision. And by the way could be the first of many um, yeah and it's it's it, the scope of what this re of what this touches on is vast it is so far beyond the remit of what any court should yeah. have domestic or international and i really do think you know we've ha we've had this when it comes to the migration issue effectively being told sotto voce you can't decide what your own uh, uh, immigration policy is because a country? court somewhere else yeah. in another co uh, country will say you know you can't do that well now we're having energy policy as well and everything that comes with that it'll yeah. be building regulations it'll yeah. be about it's our production entire economy it's it's industrial output. They can just, you know, carte blanche, go, oh, yeah, By oh, you way, have a right to this. I, it'd be bad enough if these people were judges, but they're not even judges. Mm. These people are even are lay people. They, they have, they're not even, like, you know, top QCs equivalent. They, I mean, and again, it's, it's, it's extreme. Mm. Unaccountable, yeah. unelected, undemocratic, mm. but a foreign court... Mm telling people what they can do in their country, and that would apply to us as well. Yeah, if it was a British court, and it, if these were British experts that had been appointed on you know, an open, transparent process by a no. democratically elected government, no. even then it would even be very, then. very hard. But the fact is, none of these safeguards, the, these democratic uh, safeguards, actually apply. By the way, and we're supposed to just go along the with democratic it. safeguards didn't even apply when the, in 2019 mm. uh, Theresa May pushed this through. There wasn't even a vote in Parliament on it. They talked about it for yep. less than an hour. It is absolutely extraordinary. Um, let's talk about what's going on in Parliament as well. William Bragg, bye-bye, was a 
Tory MP. We already knew he was standing down at the next election anyway. He stood down now as a select committee chair, vice chair of the 1922 Backbench Committee. Mm. He's also uh, decided he, he will no longer take the Tory whip, so he's now an independent MP until the next election. This mm. after he uh, well, exposed himself in so many different ways. Uh, he told the authorities that he had been the victim of a honey trap sting. Uh, via the Grinder da gay dating mm. website, and he had decided, in all his infinite wit and wisdom, mm. to send a naked photo of himself, including his erect tonsure. We understand. Yeah. Uh, although I have been told some numerous stories which are, are even more hair raising than that, um, uh, and uh, and and he also then was blackmailed over this, and and then decided to hand over phone numbers of his colleagues and political journalists. Treachery in the extreme. How this man, as is, as is, I mean, he was he was called courageous by Jeremy Hunt for coming forward. I think I was saying on the show yesterday, playing the gay card, mm. playing that I've had mental health and depression problems card. That is not a get out of jail uh, free card. I'm sorry, yeah. it's not. I'm sympath I'm sympathetic to any mental health problems, but I don't. If this was a straight guy. Mm who wasn't claiming these issues, mm. who'd sent these to a supposed woman, we'd all be, ha it's fine to laugh at him. No one would be calling him courageous. No, especially, I mean, you know, being a public, uh, a, member, uh, a member of parliament, being a sort of a public official representative, yeah. all of this is risky enough, you know, imaging your appendages and sending them to people as it is. But Imaging being called... your appendages. <laughs> that, guys, is what a private <laughs> education gets you, that sort of vocabulary. But I tell you what, it's even worse if your name is William. Something should have been there to say, do you know what, maybe this will come back to bite me. You know, the, the gods determine All of these phrases happen. are definitely going to end in tears absolutely aren't they? absolutely i mean honestly we all knew that he was going to lose the whip at some point he's decided to take it upon himself to do it before before the party has yeah. i understand the sort of the hesitancy because there might be questions around this that we don't know but we all knew it was going to happen it probably yeah. should have happened sooner oh, you probably. cannot trust it, rishi sunak should have taken action but again well, what normally happens well, no, is it's behind the scenes courageous. and the whip say well that was jeremy hunt Sorry, again. yes when has jeremy hunt ever said anything you've agreed with Give me two days. I'll, I mean, I'll get no, back I mean, to you. never. But I mean, Jeremy Hunt's <laughs> going to lose his seat in the next election. Hooray for that, yeah. whether he likes it or not. Um, no, but this thing—it just shows the weakness of not taking action. But again, it's just. But I think what most people are thinking mm. is, what on earth are these MPs doing all day? What they think? Well, it's tractor mm. porn. What the, I mean, what, the, <laughs> what the hell is going on in there? Whole new meaning to I've got a brand new combine harvester and I'll give you the key. I think <laughs> really, it's. I think that that's the big takeaway from this last intake of MPs is the poor quality of so many of them. Now we don't expect all of them to be perfect all the time, but well, the general okay. low standard could has they, been appalling. Could they not all be say. perverts? It would well. I mean, where? Do, hmm. I mean, I've said I got told off. <laughs> they're, they're Tory MPs. The amount of times, I, mean, the amount of times I asked people whether or not they sent a picture of their erect penis, I think I have said the word penis. I'm doing it again. The word penis on this show more times in the last week than I have. Can we have some other words that aren't off comable for for that sort of thing, just so it's we can bury it up a little? It's the biological term. I shall continue <laughs> to use it. I mean, oh no, your kids might be on Easter holiday. So, exactly. Soz about that, mums and dads. Don't send images anyway, of your William. Let's, there we go. Yeah, simple. Uh, or, or especially your uh, Willy Rag. Yes. Um, let's talk about Israel and Gaza. A number of developments here. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu um, has done an interview. He did it a week ago, but it went out on American TV last night, basically saying he believes... Not mm. Benjamin. I keep saying Benjamin. Biden uh, did You're an as interview. You're bad as Joe Biden. You can't remember who's involved in the story. It's been written story. really badly here. I'm trying to write my notes. <laughs> Biden um, yes. is on an interview in which he says that Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, is making a mistake uh, by it with his Gaza policy. Um, we know that Netanyahu is saying, look, there's a date for this invasion of Rafa. Mm. Uh, Biden also called uh, for there to be um, a, an, a six to eight week ceasefire mm. in Gaza to allow medical aid and food supplies in. Um, this also, as this morning Rishi Sunak has done some uh, pool interviews where he's talked about he wants an immediate pause in Gaza. There's no doubt at all there's been a massive concern about mm. certainly the malnutrition, the starvation uh, among among the uh, civilians in Gaza. Yeah. But but also a concern about this this Rafa uh, uh, exercise if, it, if and when this does take place. But interesting also, David Cameron at a press conference with the US Secretary of State yesterday said the UK will not suspend arms to Israel and that the current mm. legal advice is still in place and yeah. that they can still supply uh, weapons to Israel. Your thoughts on all of that? But there has been, everybody's saying there needs to be a pause. There has been a pause. We've been talking about the impending invasion of Rafa for weeks now and it's not happened. And in fact, the Israelis pulled a lot of their troops, the majority of their troops out of Gaza for some time. They have been paused, re you know, realistically. I think a lot of this is posturing. I mean, Rishi Sunak is doing this because British aid workers were killed in an errant Israeli strike. Joe Biden is calling for this because his voters are very pro-Palestine, or a lot of them are, and he fears as 
he should, that he's going to lose the next presidential uh, election. And again, That's it's not just the large coming. Muslim population. It yeah. is that the whole left of the it Democrat is the Party progressive left is virulently anti-Israel. It cannot bear the idea of Jews not being victims. As a minority, yep, it cannot bear down. the idea of them being ascendant and strong and self-determining. They hate that. But the thing is, with all of this, is the Biden administration has had to change tack. It's been putting pressure on Israel for a long time. The whole point of Israel is it, uh, existing is so that foreign governments can't pressure it into doing things it don't want. So it's gone to the... The Biden administration has gone to the Egyptians, it's gone to Gaza, uh, to Hama, uh, Qatar, sorry, and said, look, you need to put pressure on Hamas because these people will not stop. Yeah. There was then the negotiations over the hostage deal. A couple of days ago, it was suggested that was closed. And then it's come out very recently, ah, Hamas has said, these people might not be alive. Yeah. Obviously, then the Israelis are going to go, right, well, what have we got to wait well, for? Well, that? and that's the thing, isn't it? And it's getting, mm. the, 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 apparently, Israel had asked for the lease of at least 40 uh, Israeli hostages. And Hamas, basically, we, we're not sure we have 40 yes. hostages to release. Mm. We don't know whether people are dead or whether they've been sold on. There was there was mm. talk early on that people have been sold. I mean, just again, Grotesque. that is how they that is how they view human life, mm. uh, including of Palestinians. Trying mm -hmm. to make that point to an awful lot of people. Um, we shall see how that develops. It's unusual, actually, be talking so little about what's going on yeah. in Israel and Gaza today, but no doubt we'll, we'll be coming back to that. Um, I just want to talk also about um, the sale of mobile phones to under-16s. It was mooted that this could be a policy that the government was looking at uh, mm. to ban the sale of mobile phones to under-16s. They kind of rode back on it with one of those wonderful non-denial denials where they're not going to comment on policy. But it's a, it's a one-word story, this uh, one-line one story, because it's like, who do they think buys the mobile phones from to 16. Yeah, I, I, I Where are they think getting the money from to I, buy mobile phones? I, I really, I appreciate, you know, as we were talking about earlier, social media phones, yeah. it can be very damaging. We need to actually think a lot better about how we conduct hygiene around phones is the way that I put it, and perhaps that needs to be taught in schools. But a blanket ban? What is it with this government, Rishi Sunak, just Love banning ban. things? that they, Either he, Sunak likes it, chess and cricket, in which case he subsidises it, yeah. or he doesn't, in which case he just bans yeah. it. But, but also, again, I mean, like, not in favour of just banning things generally, especially when it won't work. Mm. Um, but, but also, your parents are buying them. But, you know, obviously, we're talking about, you know, smartphones yeah. rather than, you know, the old block phones. But again, it is a parenting issue. But I also understand a lot of parents, there are parents who don't do their job, an awful lot of parents who don't mm. do their mm. job properly these days. But there are also a lot of parents who want to do the job properly, but they can't have the only kid who doesn't have social media in the class because they're ostracised they don't get invited to any party so I completely understand why parents give into this but so yeah. much of this is about how you parent at home not just mm -hmm. what's happening outside it's like you know are you having family meals are you talking to each other if you're all sitting on your phone the amount of times I sit in a, a, a restaurant on a holiday and you mm -hmm. see everyone just sits down and they literally yeah. sit down and then all of them, mum, dad, you know, son or daughter, sit down and look at their phones and no one speaks. It's no one speaks. It's a fundamental issue. There needs to be a sort of a holistic approach to changing this because it is very damaging. Just going, OK, we're going to ban phones to under yeah. 16s. That's not actually Indeed. the solution. It's it's the hammer approach Indeed. to a problem. And just finally, shoplifting crackdown. Um, latest announcements today. This is the big ministerial announcement. A crackdown on shoplifters, special tags, more CCTV, you know, face recognition, mm. all that nonsense. We spoke to a former copper, Chris Phillips, a little bit earlier. We know it's an absolute load of nonsense. They, they don't they don't arrest these people. They don't charge these mm -hmm. people. If they do, and they go to court. They don't go to prison. Yeah. That we've given up. It's, we've basically legalised shoplifting. At the same time that we've decided, or Scotland rather, has decided that you know nasty words are requiring of a lot more police time. Actually, yeah. in other parts of the country, we've decided. You know what? Actually, maybe shoplifting isn't such a good thing. But I'll believe it when I see it. And the first thing I'm afraid we'll be building more police uh, 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 prison cells prison and cells. hiring more police on the beat for that sort of thing, Absolutely. responding to these sorts of things. Absolutely. That's the key thing, because again, they don't. No, exactly. No, These people are not afraid of the law. Mm. End of story. Thank you very much, Benedict. Uh, thank you. Lots and lots of topics to talk about. But we are coming to come back to our biggest topic of the day, which is this CAS review, a landmark review into uh, transgender services for children in the NHS. And basically, children who believe that they are trans, because they're not actually trans, they just believe it, should not be given puberty blockers, uh, says the review. And thousands of youngsters have been let down by the NHS. I want to know what your reaction is. You can give us a call on 0344 499 1000. Text 87222 and get in touch on X at Talk TV. A lot of you have been doing that. Let's get to some of those texts and, and uh, uh, tweets before we get to a caller. Uh, Ollie says they finished another trial social experiment more like. People have bleated about this for the past three years and the experts only see sense now. I'd like to point out someone's just uh, tweeted me um, 
X to me, whatever. Um, and I've, I've put it out again. Uh, an interview I did uh, um, online uh, in 2020 when I talked about how uh, at some point this is going to stop and people are going to start going to prison. So, you know, four years early, but, you know. Um, uh, Bella says, no child should be given anything that could potentially harm them. The only thing a confused child should be having is therapy until they become adults and then they can make their own mind up. And Ben says, children are not allowed to make major life choices in any other instance. This is no uh, different. Uh, this is uh, absolutely crucial there. Um, I do want to go to another call. Um, I'm told there's some breaking news, but it is not on my screen. Um, someone's shouting in my ear that it is, uh, but there is uh, some uh, um, there's breaking news coming in in the next couple of moments. Uh, first up, though, let's go, <laughs> let's go to a caller. Um, this is Katie uh, in the West Midlands. Katie, I understand you're not giving your real name um, because you are a teacher. What is your experience of what is going on? Hi Juliet, thanks for taking my call. Um, so my um, first experience of working with children with um, trans um, views that they were they 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 were trans um, was about eight years ago. Um, can the child, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. So sorry, Juliet. No, um, no. The, the child at the time was about seven years old. Yeah. Um, and we were, um, as a, um, a staffing team, um, taken into a meeting. Um, we had a representative um, of um, uh, the LGBT community um, that was brought in. There, there isn't an LGBT community. Can I just say the, that the, straight away? You know, the, I don't know um, what what their um, their professional title was. It's been yeah. so long. I'm so sorry. They came mm -hmm. from the um, local authority. Um, they were probably a quango that came in third um, third hand that the, the council just brought in to speak to us. But basically, we were sat in this room. Uh, we had um, it shoved down our throats that we had got to start recognising this child as the opposite gender, um, and talking to this child with um, its preferred pronouns, um, and that if we didn't follow that guidance, we were going to be um, affecting this child's mental health. Yeah. Um, I can remember quite clearly in that meeting that um, several members of staff did query and, and ask questions of this person um, that made this person uncomfortable um, and it was turned around straight onto us. We were being negative. It was, it it was, was shut down was, straight away. Yeah, the so message went out, uh-uh, don't Absolutely. ask, don't question, you'll be the bad no, person. don't question us, you're the bad people for questioning us. Um, I know, you know, mm. there's lots of talk of teachers pushing this. Um, we're all left-wing and we're pushing this mm. ideology. There are a lot of us that are not. I have got children myself. I, um, I find this abhorrent. It's child abuse. Um, it's not just um, emotional child abuse. It's the physicalities to it, the, um, the effects on bone growth in young children that are being given puberty blockers. Um, it, 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 Something has got to happen. Absolutely. Oh, I'm with you all the way. I, look, I don't think all teachers are doing this. I think most teachers are sensible and are completely horrified by this, but it is being pushed and basically being, being told your career's over if you do question it and you're having to watch it happen in front of you. Uh, Katie has to say, not your real name. I so appreciate you, Cordy. Look, you know, keep being a, a quiet voice of sanity. Uh, we need more of those. I appreciate that. Thank you very much indeed for getting in touch. If you want to get in touch, give us a call. 0344 499 11.30 is the time. Ben Habib up next on that absurd European Court of Human Rights decision. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. 
Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good morning to you. This is Talk TV with me, Julia Hartley Brewer. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. Still in the studios with me is Benedict Spence. Get his thoughts on what my next guest has to say. He's Ben Habib. He's Deputy Leader of Reform UK and a former MEP as well. Good morning to you, Ben. Good morning, Julia. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, there's lots to talk Thank about, you. but I do want to start with the European Court of Human Rights and this absolutely absurd judgment that was made yesterday in the case of a bunch of elderly Swiss women, I say elderly, but in their 70s, um, and they've claimed that because of their age, they're more at risk of dying in a heat wave, and therefore their human rights have been impacted by the Swiss government's complete failure, they say, uh, to actually tackle climate change and to uh, stick to their net zero pledges and cut uh, carbon emissions, and that therefore the Swiss government must act to protect their human rights. I mean, possibly the biggest expansion ever. My God, we've seen a lot of expansions of the jurisdiction of this court. What do you make of that ruling and what should we do about it? Well, it is absurd, as you've already indicated, Julia. Um, you, you can't have a human rights court adjudicating on matters of government policy, which effectively is what they've done. You know, our response to this notional uh, man-made climate change that's taking place. And it's worth noting that Switzerland produces less than 0.1% of global carbon emissions. As do uh, we. Utterly absurd. Uh, we, well, I think we do less than 1%. Then they're one tenth That's only because we, we closed down all our industry. We, I'd be proud if we were producing more. <laughs> anyway, but the real point here is that you've got a court which has 18 conventions which guide it and it can interpret those conventions in any which way it likes it doesn't in, it doesn't enforce the law that's made by legislature in a democratic way it's a bunch of guys sitting or a bunch of girls and guys sitting in a room deciding how the convention should be applied yeah. and they're not even they judges make... these people aren't even people with you know they're not vast brilliant legal minds even no, well, clearly not. And um, and they and once they make these laws, once they adjudicate, um, they effectively make law, particularly in the case of the United Kingdom, because Tony Blair, in all his wisdom, elevated the European Court of Human Rights to the supreme, yeah. being the supreme judicial body in the United Kingdom for yeah. such issues above the Supreme Court. Yeah. So even though this is a Swiss case. Um, and has nothing to do with the United Kingdom, we will now find in our country that we will have to take note of the European Court's ruling. Yeah. It is an affront to democracy, actually, Julia, is what's taking place here. Yeah, I mean, it absolutely is. But we, the only solution to this, you know and I know, is to leave the European Court of Human Rights, something that Rishi Sunak has sort of 
vaguely pol in an interview with The Sun the other week might be something that he would consider putting into the manifesto, thinking, but they're not going to get elected. So, you know, but half of Tory voters in the latest poll have suggested that they want to leave the European Court, Court of Human Rights. And that's just relating to Rwanda policy, which is believed that the European Court will have an impact and stop even, even if we ever get everything through the courts, through the through Parliament here, that we're actually going to uh, ever see any flights take off. And even if we do, future ones will be stopped. Who are we kidding? It's not going to make a difference to anything. But it does really just feel like there is now a groundswell of opinion among a lot of voters that we just we need we need to stop allowing you know not just the courts but foreign courts from having a say over the day-to-day -day running of our government well, well you know actually it, it, it's a breach of their own mandate because the universal declaration of human rights article 21 requires that people are governed through a democratic process and if you have a foreign court yeah. which is not accountable to the british people making laws on the hoof that fundamentally undermines democracy. And of course, you know, we see this right across um, the political landscape. We've seen it since Tony Blair came to office, David Cameron, Theresa May, and indeed Boris Johnson and Sunak after him. In creating and empowering quangos and supranational institutions, taking power away from the legislature in the United Kingdom and giving it to people but who are not accountable to the people of this country. Yeah. That is anti-democratic. Yeah. And we've had our democracy assaulted on all fronts for many, many years now. Mm -hmm. And I, you're absolutely right. We've got, to, we've got to leave the convention or at the very least remove the court from having any jurisdiction in the yes. United Kingdom. And yeah, again, which we can easily do. And again, we're allowed to change the law on that. And there's this idea that we won't have any human rights in this country if we don't have this court. And it was only the Europe that, that gave us human rights. I hate to tell you guys and girls, you know, we're the ones who delivered uh, the, the human rights to most of Europe. You're welcome, is what we should be saying to them. <laughs> um, let's also talk about um, Rwanda again. I mean, I, I only want, you know what? I only want the policy to get off the ground now or be killed off completely, just so I don't have to keep talking about it, because I still don't think it's going to change anything about the number of channel migrants we have. Uh, but Rishi Snacker said, yet again, he still does expect Rwanda flights to take off from spring, despite the fact we've now learned that vast amount of the local housing supposedly going to be given to those migrants being uh, sent to Rwanda has actually been <laughs> sold off to local Rwandans. I mean, and apparently they were already yeah. on estate agent websites when Suella Bradman, when she was Home Secretary, visited Rwanda. What do you make I mean, the that? whole Rwanda thing is a waste of time, Julia. We've wasted money on it. We've wasted time on it on air. Um, the whole thing is a distraction. Even if, as you say, flights take off, it's not going to be any deterrent whatsoever to people seeking to cross the channel. They've faced much bigger risks and much bigger hardship in order to make that journey to the UK. And they have the big carrot of you know, £50,000 a year being spent on them once they get here. No way is Rwanda ever going to work. I call it performative government policy or performative legislation. It's fundamentally designed to distract uh, uh, us from the yeah. core issue, which is that the boats need to be stopped in the channel physically by border force. The reason border force is called border force is because they're meant to use force at the border. <laughs> But we've forgotten what that means. <laughs> that's a, that's a very that's a very fair point, actually. Um, it is it is extraordinary. Also, um, latest stats from the Home Office. Um, and this in, in, in extraordinary in, in relation to, as we've seen again and again, cases where uh, people have been allowed to stay in this country who are criminals and then have gone on to commit horrific crimes, including that awful al you know, al alkali attack on a mother and her children in Clapham. But uh, Home Office asylum decisions, we learned, are being overturned by more than half of applicants. Uh, this, as they revealed, uh, um, reveals that a convicted sex offender was awarded refugee status after a judge ruled he'd be at risk of mob violence in Afghanistan. So, basically, even though he was convicted of outraging public decency and exposure in 2017 placed on the sex offenders register he was allowed to remain here because he could he could uh, uh, be at risk of violence in Afghanistan it's like I don't want any to be at risk of violence in Afghanistan but I'm not sure why he has to be our women's problem when he was a risk uh, to women now given that half of decisions by the Home Office on asylum are overturned on appeal um, does that suggest that those decisions are wrong or does that suggest that the appeals process is run by a load of bleeding hearters. Well, we have a system that is tilted completely in favour of those who 
are seeking asylum, no matter how it is that they got to the United Kingdom. One of the great things that Suella Braverman tried to do, which he failed to, to achieve, but which he tried, was to make it impossible for anyone who entered the country illegally to apply for asylum. Remember, that was the point yeah. of the illegal migrant, or one of the key points of the illegal migration yeah. bill, which then became the act. But by the time it became an act, they'd removed that crucial bit of legislation. So, um, you know, that legislation is not there on the statute yeah. books where so, it should be. So what was the so point you've got a it? system which has been hijacked by bleeding heart liberals. That's, you know, that's what we've got. The asylum system is hijacked, Julia. Yeah, There's no real adjudication taking place on people's merits. You yeah. know, they can find any old excuse to stay in the UK. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just finally, um, no doubt at all, you know, you're deputy leader of Reform UK, um, doing very well in the polls, riding up consistently week by week, different polling companies seeing uh, your poll ratings going up, uh, doing better than the Tories in some polls in the north of the country uh, and among men. Um, realistically, though, as well as you can do in these polls, when it comes to the local elections, in terms of the number of candidates you're standing, when it comes to the general election, likely October, November this year, in terms of the candidates you stand, you could well end up without a single MP or matter maybe a couple uh, and, and have no impact. Would Reform UK have more impact doing a deal with the Tories than <laughs> remaining as their sort of as their sort of bet noir in the polls? Ben, come on. I'll, I'll tell me he hasn't frozen. Ben Habib. Can you? Oh, no, he's frozen. Hopefully, can we get him back? Let's see if hopefully we can get him back. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I want to try and get him back. Um, and Benedict is going to answer, uh, answer that question. Benedict we have a spare Ben here that. in the studio. Got, we useful, always keep a spare Ben in mm. case, case the other Ben mm. uh, does freeze. Mm. On the, Benedict Spence, do you, do you think, I mean, oh, he's, no, I like, no, we'll, we'll come back to our spare Benedict in a moment. Ben Habib, <laughs> um, would you like to answer that question? Yeah, there will, oh, there will be no deals with the Conservative Party. When I joined Reform UK, there will be no deals with the Conservative Party. I have it in writing from Richard Tice, a solemn promise, um, which was the basis on which I joined Reform UK, yeah. that we will do no deals with them. The Conservative Parliamentary Party deserves to be obliterated and obliterated it shall be. And unless and until they discover what conservatism means, they, are, they have no truck with the name. They have no right to the name Conservative Party. Okay. So that answers the first bit of it. The second Very bit briefly. is that the political, the political wind is in our sails. At, as, as, as the polls go at the moment, we may not get any seats. But if we break through the magic 20% barrier, we will get seats. Okay. And for every percent above 20%, we'll get disproportionately greater numbers of seats. So we aim to get seats in the general election. OK, well, there's strong words from Ben Habib. I'm so glad we got you back on the line. Ben Habib there, Deputy Leader of Reform UK. But I'll, I'll, I'll spare Ben, Ben <laughs> takes Ben. That's what you're going to be called from now. Um, mm. What do you make of that? I think it's a very tricky situation for a lot of conservative-minded people. Who do you vote for? Because there's no two ways about this. As bad as the Conservatives have been, and they have, things will be worse under Labour. So that we, that's, this is always the problem that the Brexit Party to agree had, but certainly UKIP had. People might get to the, to the polling booth on the day and think to themselves, do you know what, actually, I can't bear the idea of Labour being in. I won't vote reform, I'll vote Tory. The issue that the Tories have, I don't think, is reform. I think it's Tory voters not coming out to vote at all when the general election finally happens. I don't think there will be uh, you know, a pact between the two. That would be suicide for reform. You know, it, it would never win any support back if its, if, its, if its supporters felt that they were just sort of you know, a crutch for the Conservative Party to stand on. But it's going to be very tough, I think, for a lot of Conservative voters to make that decision. Yeah, indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, well, let's get back to our social question this morning about the uh, latest uh, review, the landmark review into uh, transgender treatment for children, basically saying that children should not be given puberty blockers. Youngsters have been let down. Social transitioning is not proven to help them either. Do get in touch. You can call 0344 499 1000. You can text 87222 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Um, some of your text messages and uh, tweets coming in. Uh, Jenny says uh, her reaction is good. Youngsters are notorious for making bad decisions. This is permanent. More and more young people are coming forward saying they were conned. Um, Carla says, as the proud parent of two queer kids, <sighs> Carla, queer used to just be a term of abuse for gay people when I was a kid. I don't like that word. Um, as the proud parent of two queer kids, actually one transgender child and one pansexual child, it it breaks my heart. I've been fighting for trans rights all my life and now they are coming after the most vulnerable of all trans folks, the trans children. I will fight even harder, whatever it takes. There is... 
Carla, no such thing as a trans child. No girl is born in a boy's body and no boy is born in a girl's body. There is certainly no such thing as a pansexual child. This is a load of nonsense. You are indoctrinating your children with your bizarre, crazy ideology. And I'm afraid that you are the one who is hurting your children, not the people trying to stop children from being caught up in this horrible, medicalised ideology. I hope you won't fight harder. If I were you, as a mum, I don't know whether you call yourself a mum. I don't know or not. But um, I would be fighting even harder for my children just to live normal, happy lives and to be themselves. And for your daughter, whoever it is to be a girl, and your son to be a boy, and whether they're gay or straight or went to wear different clothes or not, it's totally irrelevant. Just let them be. This is Talk TV. We'll take a break. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square because you've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good morning to you. This is Talk at TV with me, Julia hartley -Burr. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. Just some news that's broken in the last 20 minutes or so. Three people have been charged with public order offences following a pro-Palestine demonstration outside Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer's house uh, on uh, Tuesday night last night. That's according to the Metropolitan Police. I have to say, good. Uh, not a fan of people demonstrating outside politicians' homes of any kind. If you want to demonstrate, demonstrate outside of offices, outside Parliament. Uh, that's just intimidation. It's not something that should be part of our democracy. Benedict Spencer with me. It's just outrageous. 
outrageous, I'm isn't sure it? sure these people weren't the far right. I was told that it was only the far right that were oh, yeah. intimidating so, people. So difficult to keep up. Yeah, they're on the march so across Europe, but they must be very slow because they've been on the march for some time and they've never quite they've got They've never there. quite made but, it, um, yeah, but I mean, it's disgraceful, though, isn't it, that we tolerate it's, it's this? Intimi it's intimidating. Well, again, we don't tolerate it. The police the don't tolerate it. Just mm. go in, knock them down. I'm sorry, take them out in those police vans and send them away for a long time. Message needs to go out loud and clear, does it not? Right, 11.51 is the time. I just want to talk about, well... Um, <laughs> Extraordinary story. Um, uh, this is uh, this is a story that uh, is a claim uh, that um, a four day week. Those of us who do work a four day week now, thank you very much. But I did, I did, I took the twenty percent pay cut. I didn't say five days pay for a four day week. I, I was I'm totally honest about it. But a lot of people have been moving to a four day week. But a four day week could be, we're told, racist, according to a new report by who else? The Welsh government. They say reduced hours may widen inequalities between office staff and those who work on the front line, especially when you're looking at services which operate twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. So white collar workers benefit more um, uh, than uh, than those who are in blue collar jobs and it's more likely that we know in many uh, groups of workers that ethnic minorities are, are maybe more likely to be working in those blue collar jobs is it racist well let's talk uh, to someone who's a big fan of the four day week joe ryle is director of the four day week campaign uh, good morning to you great to find you working today <laughs> Hi, Julia. I'm pleased to hear you're working a four-day week as well. Uh, well, uh, yeah, but uh, there's a difference between a four-day week and a five-day week where you're put, pretending to put it into four days. I, di I didn't expect to be paid for the day I sat at home. Well, I mean, you know, well, you know, we argue for a four-day week with no loss of pay because you know, I know. we seen. Because basically, well, you discovered seen. that most people only do four days' work, and when they go, whenever, when anyone says, "Oh, we haven't cut any, we've we've, we've lost nothing in output, we've improved productivity," no, what well, fifth of the time your staff were doing nothing. That's why you've been able to do it over a four-day week. But let's talk about: is it racist to have a four-day week? I mean, this is I mean, a new one on me. I mean, yeah, I mean, I hope you can agree. It is a bit of a nonsense headline, I have to say. I mean, it obviously grabs people's attention, but. Um, my understanding is it was a report by the Welsh Government that was very kind of positive about the benefits of a four day working week and the potential pilot they're going to run there. There was one paragraph in the report that said it could exacerbate some existing inequalities. I don't know how the journalists and the Telegraph has ended up with, with the four day week could be racist. I mean, the truth is that claims of four day week could widen inequality. You know, they're wrong. They're, they're way off the mark because actually those that stand to benefit most from a four day week include people like disabled people, those with caring responsibilities on the margins of society. You know, it's going to make a tremendous difference to their lives, having one day less at work with no loss in pay. So I have to say, it does seem like a, a nonsense story. Well, it will well. benefit some, but it will, it will hurt others. But the reality is, as we know, you know, is that there, there are only certain jobs that can be squidged into four days as opposed to five days because other jobs do need to be done. Basically, you're going to have to hire someone else to do those jobs at that time. You can't be a waitress working from home or a taxi driver working from home or or work in the, you know, on the production line of a factory and work from home or, you know, or say, well, I'm just going to get more done in four days and five days. Those machines operate at a certain rate. They need to be uh, mended and serviced and the like. And the reality is that a lot of the new working practices, the move to four-day week, and people working from home as well, which often seems to be added in to that. Um, it, it, it's, it's for office workers. But everyone else, I mean, people still need their bins collected. They still need people manning supermarkets. So it doesn't work for everyone else. So this is actually about, basically, the middle classes getting to do fewer hours, isn't it? That's not true. I mean, that may have been true a few years ago, but actually, as you were saying at the beginning, the four-day week has come a long way since then. And actually, in the last few years, we've seen all sorts of different companies adopting a four-day week. We've had firms in the construction sector, retail, manufacturing. Well, we the construction companies... sector. So we're just going to, we're only going to do building on Monday to Thursday, but not on a Friday. And how is that benefiting the construction sector? Well, the problem industry? in the construction sector is that workers are so tired and exhausted working five days that actually lots of builders report they're knackered by Friday and don't get much done on a Friday. Human anyway, beings used to work sector. a six or seven um, day week. I mean, in most societies, until about 30, 40 years ago, everybody worked a six day week. And they were grateful yeah, for it. Yeah, I know. And it's it's time for change. I mean, look, there's certain industries where it's, it's definitely going to be more difficult to implement. You know, I'll be honest about that. But what we're talking about here is a kind of long term transition. We're not saying everyone can move to a four day week overnight. Of course not. You know, there's got to be a transition to get there. But we do think over a period of like a decade, in the same way that we moved from a six-day week to a five-day week 100 years ago, we do think the economy can start to transition to a four-day week. If you think about automation, new technology, artificial intelligence, 
all of these technologies are going to make us more productive and so we have to be in the work you know we should be in the workplace gonna, less so we can all have time to enjoy our I lives. think it's going to make some jobs more productive. I'm not sure it's going to make a lot of them, though. I'm really good to talk to you. Always good, uh, fun to have you on the show. Uh, Joe Ryle there, director of the Four Day Week campaign on, on one of his working days. Benedict Spence, I mean, how many have, days a week do you work? I, I don't take days off, as anybody who tunes into any sort of television show. Get rid of him. Yes, I'm bedded in like a tick. The idea that automation is going to sort of take over things, that only works in an industrialised society. So yeah. China and Japan are getting a yeah. lot of that, but we aren't because we don't make anything. Ultimately, very that's good, not very helpful. Very isn't? good point. And it's not racist <laughs> madness. That's no. the Welsh government for you. Love them. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to <laughs> 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Primetime show on Talk TV and radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a cat. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. Good afternoon to you and welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Where have you been the last two hours if you're just tuning in? Coming up in this are the Landmark Cast Review into NHS Transgender Services for Children says the evidence for allowing children to change gender is based on remarkably weak uh, evidence and calls for an end to rushing children into treatment and a ban on pu puberty blockers for under-18s. Also, 
the U.S. President Joe Biden has called on Israel to agree to an eight-week ceasefire in Gaza to allow humanitarian aid in. This comes after Foreign Secretary here, Lord Cameron, confirmed in Washington that UK arms sales to Israel will not be suspended. This amid claims of war crimes by Israel. And traffic congestion in London under the ULES Ultra Emission Zone has um, got worse in the last five years rather than better. That's weird. I thought it was supposed to make lives better for us. We'll talk about all of that and plenty more besides coming up after an update of the latest news headlines with Divya Coney. This is Talk TV News. Good afternoon. A major review into gender services is calling for a more cautious approach to children who are confused about their sex. It found children have been let down by lack of evidence on medical interventions in gender care. The review, led by Dr Hilary Cass, is calling for a more holistic approach to the services, especially for children with mental health needs. Gay rights and feminist activist Linda Bellos told Talk TV she's relieved by the findings. I've been a lesbian feminist for, well, 40 years. I've seen this happen only in this way in the last five to seven years. It wasn't happening. Many of my trans friends didn't have the kind of pressures that are being made now. The Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has defended the decision not to stop arming Israel, saying none of our closest allies have done so. The Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, made the announcement on his US visit amid growing pressure over the government's weapons trade with Israel, following an airstrike which killed aid workers and the ever-increasing humanitarian crisis in Gaza. To support Israel and its legitimate right of self-defence to deal with the Hamas threat, and it's important we maintain... Of that support. We back the hostages and their families who are now in day 185 of their appalling captivity. We go hard on getting aid into Gaza. A fresh crackdown has been launched on retail crime with violence against shop workers to be made a specific criminal offence. Persistent shoplifters could also be forced to wear tags. Victims and safeguarding minister Laura Farris has suggested shoplifting is by and large linked to organised crime rather than the cost of living. The shopkeeper in London told us it's hard to see how these measures will be implemented. Shoplifting has almost been decriminalised and it was out of control. We had so many staff leave uh, the job. Um, they're threatened uh, with violence and abuse. So this is a step in the right direction, but I'm not entirely sure how they're going to implement it. We have existing laws, we have existing legislation, but if the prisons are full and they're threatening uh, to put uh, offenders who uh, attack shop staff into jail, then where is this space going to come from? Meanwhile, 7.4 million adults are struggling to pay their bills due to the cost of living crisis. That's according to a new survey by the Financial Conduct Authority, which found one in nine adults had missed a bill in the six months to January. The same proportion of people had no disposable income. Despite slowing inflation, energy bills and food prices remain much higher than they were a few years ago. The U.S. state of Arizona has reinstated a near-total abortion ban. The laws, which were abolished 160 years ago, have been brought back, which could make abortion punishable by up to five years in prison unless a mother's life is at risk. And it could see clinics shut down across the state. It comes two years after the historic overturning of the Roe v. Wade legislation. And three-time Olympic gold medalist Max Whitlock has announced his retirement. The 31-year-old, Britain's most successful gymnast, has said he will be standing down after the Paris Olympics. He says his main motivation for the next Games is that he wants his daughter Willow, who's five, to watch him compete. That's the latest weather time now with Nazmin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
Hello, a chilly but sunny start across many parts of Britain this morning, but rain already across the west will be steadily moving eastwards through this afternoon. Some heavy downpours, especially for western parts of Scotland, where there's a warning for the rain from the Met Office, valid until 10 p.m. as flooding issues are possible there. The rain most persistent across Scotland, patchy in nature across England, Wales and Northern Ireland, reaching eastern England by the end of today. But it is feeling mild compared to recently temperatures up to around 14 degrees Celsius. And it stays mild overnight night, noticeably so compared to last night, but cloudy and wet conditions continue to move eastwards and southwards as the cold front moves rain across northern and western parts of England and Wales. Further south and east, it will be murky, but I think mostly dry there and becoming drier for Northern Ireland, but wet everywhere else. And then through tomorrow, we'll continue to see the rain clear away eastwards and southwards. That cold front, though, lingering along the south coast, so quite a cloudy, damp, dull day there, as well as feeling cool. But everywhere else, some good spells of sunshine, brighter conditions and mainly dry and also feeling fairly mild with temperatures up to around 16 to 17 degrees Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the show. This is actually the Hartley Brewer on Talk TV. Very much appreciate you joining me. We are on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Uh, still with me in the studio is Benedict Spence, Conservative commentator, who joins me uh, throughout the show. Uh, thanks so much for joining us again, Benedict. Um, I do want to talk more about uh, this cat review into uh, puberty blockers given to uh, children who believe they are trans. I'm still reeling, actually, from that uh, uh, message we had in from Carla as the proud parent of two queer kids i don't even like that word queer it's a term, it was a term of abuse in my childhood yeah. for gay kids actually one transgender child no such thing and one pansexual child she said it breaks my heart fighting for trans rights i mean i mean again pansexual that's just what we used to call bi kid you you know bisexual yeah uh, again i think it's one of those things where they've created a label so that people feel special about themselves it's like how do i make myself different from the bisexual people yeah. ah this new thing i mean the, the asexual thing is the one that completely throws me they don't they don't have sex with anyone demisexual well, well, or... but, but, but be quiet about it no one's yeah. interested i don't understand why that needs a label it's never needed a label before they've always existed there's an awful lot of labels though that's the thing and that's where it shows you it's not a serious thing it's about how do i make myself stand out from the rest of the herd that's basically yeah, right. absolutely. 40 well, odd different i tell you identities. i tell you who has stood out from the rest of the herd is, is the 7,152 people who have made complaints to Police Scotland uh, since Scotland's new hate crime law that came into uh, uh, into force um, on the 1st of April, April Fool's Day. I do love that they did that, <laughs> give us that little treat. Uh, 240 hate crimes and 30 non-crime hate incidents have actually been recorded, the force has announced. So more than 7,000 complaints, we were told it was in the region of possibly 8,000, but a mm. huge number of complaints absolutely overwhelming police forces now a lot of those they won't be looking into it'll be the same complaint mm. again and again about the same person no doubt jk rowling mm -hmm. she said basically <laughs> report me police come and arrest me i don't mm. care i felt exactly the same way as did many other uh, women turfs as we're called um but, I mean, what a complete waste of police resources. Honestly, I mean, I'm very glad that Scotland has decided to trial this between, because, you know, before Westminster. Because oh, Labour want imagine, to bring this in. Oh, you can imagine that it would happen um, under a Labour government. Um, so I'm very happy it's happened somewhere else and we can all have a good laugh at it. But uh, is it going to be rode back anytime soon? You know, even in the face of this absolute nonsense? Almost certainly not. I suspect no. the SNP will double down on it because that's what they do. They like to get ahead of everybody else and then just not, not admit their mistakes. And in the wake of the cash review into NHS England's care for children who believe they are trans i've no doubt as we know it's still continuing in nhs scotland i think they'll double down on that mm. as well well look, let's talk more about that right now with my next guest who is shivani dave uh, she is a journalist and a presenter at virgin radio just just down the corridor uh, good afternoon to you shivani good afternoon julia Thanks. you know my pronouns are they them how are you doing yeah um thank you for telling me your pronouns i use correct grammar so the only the only thing I would need to refer you to is very, to your face would be you. But I'm, I'm not being rude. You can choose your pronouns. You can choose what you want to call yourself. But you don't have a, you don't get to require me to use incorrect grammar and factually incorrect things. You're not a plural. You're a, you're a, you're a one person, and you're a, you're a female person. So I will use she and her. Thank you very much. Do what you like. I guess. Well, there you are. You didn't need to tell me then, did you? Maybe I'm just making sure people know in case they're watching and they want to refer to me respectfully. Is it disrespectful for me to use correct factual grammar? It's not incorrect or unfactual grammar to use singular they, them pronouns for an individual. 
But we're here to talk about the cast review. We are, but but you but you chose but you chose to bring it up. You chose to use the incorrect pronouns for me. I I'm chose to use the it. correct pronouns for a single woman who is appearing on my show. I'm not a single woman, though. I'm a very special non-binary trans person, as you just pointed out. I, I didn't really just point that out. Crowd. I didn't just point that out. I introduced you as a journalist and a virgin radio presenter. No, just before I came on, you were talking about how people with all these labels like mm. to be special. And I'm just making sure that everyone knows I'm special. OK, I'm not special. I'm just a boring old heterosexual married woman. But, you know, sorry about that. We're not allowed to do that anymore. In fact, that probably does make me special now. I don't know. Anyway, Shivani, we're colleagues and I want to... I obviously, obviously want to treat respect, but again, for me, respect works both ways and that also requires people on both sides to be respectful of people's willingness to not want to tell lies or to be dishonest to themselves. So we'll have to respect each other's views on this. Let's talk about Hilary Cass, who's the most important person here. Well, most important person who's actually trying to do something to uh, look after children, in my view. She's a paediatrician. She's the former president of the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health. She's carried out a four-year review into the services provided for children who believe they are trans in NHS England. Uh, it doesn't apply to NHS Scotland, sadly. But she's basically said that the evidence for the treatment of children is weak. It's based on shaky foundations. There is no good evidence for long-term outcomes for the puberty blockers and other treatments. She's uh, called for an end to all puberty blocking hormone drugs to be given to under 18s. She wants even a more therapeutic, holistic approach to those aged 17 to 25, uh, which is when brain development is still happening. A full pause in any treatment for 16 and 17 year old new patients. She says there's also no clear evidence that social transitioning, we know that's happening at schools a lot where teachers are saying, yes, you can be referred to by your preferred pronouns, you can change your gender at school and you can change your name, even without parents knowing about it. That's against uh, government guidance, but they still allow it. Um, she says there's no clear evidence that social transitioning has positive impact or negative impact on this. Um, do you welcome her report, Shivani? I think that the report um, also highlights some things that could benefit trans health care for trans young people massively. I think holistically looking at the health care of people aged 17, to 25 is massively beneficial. I think uh, regional services for trans people, it could be beneficial. And I also think um, the idea that doctors, clinicians would get training and access to more information about how to treat trans young people would massively be beneficial. Um, I think there are some things in the guidance which, if implemented correctly, could really, really help young people who are questioning their gender, wondering about whether or not they've got a trans identity and um, even trans themselves. I think that there's definitely stuff in there that if implemented correctly and, you know, bearing in mind that the people implementing this stuff are going to be medical professionals, doctors, nurses, people like that. And they are trying their best to think about the welfare of their patients. Well, if, they, if they've been... Their patients hold on a minute. Young people who... <laughs> If medical professionals have been doing that all along, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in now where we have a report pointing out that most of what has been done over the last 10 or so years is not evidence-based, as does huge damage, and actually is, is not making lives better uh, and certainly not the health of young children better who believe that they are trans. Well, if you look at what lots of trans people have been talking about when it comes to the former service, GIDS, uh, gender identity services That's the Tavistock, in, yeah. in the UK, a lot of trans people have been saying that um, those services are inadequate. And, you know, in fact, they were reviewed and they were inadequate, found to be inadequate. And Inadequate uh, as in there were long waiting lists. What does show is that uh, these services need to be brought up to speed with A, the amount of people, the amount of patients they're seeing, and B, with clinicians and staff who have better training and understanding of what it is that these patients need. OK, I mean, the, the inadequate because there was a long waiting list. Thank God there was a long waiting list. That will have saved many children from being p damaged with puberty blockers and possibly facing mutilation of their bodies further down the line after being put on that railroad track towards that. I, I'd say thank God uh, for that. However, many children have not been saved, in, in my view. I don't accept there is any such thing as a trans child. There are children who I think are being indoctrinated uh, on you know, YouTube, their parents. Um, I see it again and again. I mean, you know, 
Carla, who's got in touch, talking about having a pansexual child and a trans child. No, you've just got two children who... Julia, um, it's great that you have that thought. You can totally have that opinion. Yeah. And it's even more amazing based that on fact. You, therefore, I'm not a doctor or any form of medical professional actually implementing any sort of health... Well, no, but no, no, you don't have to be a doctor to know that no one is born in the wrong body. This used to be called gender dysphoria. People who believe that they are born dysphoria. in the wrong body. That doesn't mean they are born in the wrong body. It doesn't mean people shouldn't be treated with kindness and respect. And absolutely, one of the things that Hilary Cass is talking about, how we need this holistic therapeutic response support. So I, so talking Julie, to people... it kind of sounds like you're saying them. that being trans or having a trans identity doesn't really exist. People can have a trans identity, but no, no one is born in the wrong body. Your body is your body. Correct, yeah. So, but people can feel more comfortable with their bodies after they, receiving treatment. Some people do. Actually, the evidence actually is pretty clear where there has been, and there's been very little follow-up on people who've been treated, that actually many people feel very much more unhappy afterwards because they don't know the full implications of either I'd the really puberty like blockers or the... Where, I'd really like to see where you get that figure from, though, because I didn't give a figure. people regret getting knee surgeries as opposed to people who... People don't choose to get knee surgery when there's nothing wrong with their knees, do they? That's that's. Very People that's don't get silly given gender-affirming care if there's nothing, you know, going nothing, on with their gender. Nothing going on with their gender. No, this is a this is a mental health issue. Not to say it's a mental illness, but a mental health issue. In the same way, someone who has an eating disorder, who believes that their body is too fat, when actually it's painfully, possibly morbidly too thin, we don't affirm their views. We don't help them get thinner. We try to help them... To, to to be to treat their body more healthy. So I don't know why we should treat this any differently. Let me let so me. Would just... your suggestion be people who are trans or people who are uh, seeking gender affirming health care shouldn't get that treatment and should be talking about it in therapy, for example, because that's a form I... of conversion therapy. Yes, of course I knew. I, yes, that, that that is what and that's what many people are arguing, and it's a load of abject nonsense. Children, one hundred percent, shouldn't have any. Uh, of this sort of treatment. I completely I stand by that. It's very clear from what uh, Hilary Cass, who knows a lot better than both you and I, said, that she's talking about a much more, well, less medicalised approach, even to the age of 25. If someone is an adult and That's wants to, and wants to mutilate their body and take drugs to change their body, that, I think, should be entirely up to them. But to have a whole medical system and a political ideology that is in encouraging them to do that and telling them that all of their problems will be solved if they do that no i don't think that should be happening julia i don't think you actually understand what trans health care is in this country if you think it's that easy to get any form of health care any form of hormones any form of puberty blockers any form of surgery um and also i, know I think parents have done it dangerous. I know parents who've been there with their children have been absolutely horrified by how quick. Loads of reports, loads of whistleblowers at the Tavistock, people actually working there have been horrified and have resigned and spoken out because of how quickly that process can be once people get into those clinics. That's not the case for so many people who are desperately trying to get the health care they need to be able to survive. The health care they think they want is different. They no, don't the health care that they need, because doctors sign it off. Doctors perform Well, in that treatment. case... This is something that NHS England, the World Health Organization, all of the major health bodies around the world recognise as a real thing, being no, trans. People, no, people, people to... thinking they're born in the, wrong, in the wrong body is a real thing. People being born in the wrong body is not that's not a, that's not me being hateful or transphobic. It is a simple matter of fact that Julia, people are I'm born in their own body. Transphobic, but what I have said is what I think you're you're saying is kind of dangerous because it's eradicating the idea that trans people exist, and it's actually no, this, what, the, what, what you're advocating. It's not eradicating the idea of the trans. It's just I don't accept the I don't accept your characterization of a trans person. People who believe that they are trans is different from saying trans people exist. Yeah, exactly. And I disagree with what you're saying and you're disagreeing with what I'm saying. But mine's based and on what fact. what you're saying is, is an eradication of trans identities and, and harmful. OK, I mean, I disagree with you. Um, what about the point that, as Hilary Cass made and numerous professionals have made, whistleblowers and others, that, that a huge number 
huge number of those who are coming forward in their teenage years uh, for believing that they are trans have suffered from some sort of trauma, um, have suffered from neglect or abuse. A huge percentage, the majority indeed, have um, autism or other uh, neurodivergent uh, issues. Um, and in case of girls, a massive increase in this matter of just you know, a handful of years from a few dozen girls coming forward believing they were trans to now thousands of girls. Now, the majority of those wanting to have treatment in their teenage years are girls, when actually most of those girls are simply gay and don't seem to be able to accept it or their families won't accept it or think that that is, that is something that's wrong. Um, the fact that these are troubled children, sometimes abused children, children with learning difficulties uh, like, uh, uh, or, or neurodivergent issues, or are simply young lesbians who are being told that there's something wrong with them that needs to be changed. Does that not appall you? Yeah, I mean, if it was true, <clears throat> we don't know. If it we was don't know. We, 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 we what, do know what, it's what true. What the review There's a says, whole report about it, 388 yes, pages. What, what the report says is that these issues need to be looked into further. Not every single child who has experienced trauma I or didn't abuse say is that. trans. No one Not said every trans that. person has experienced abuse or trauma. Not every single person who is neurodiverse is trans. No. Not every single person who is trans is neurodiverse. But you don't need to make those these points. These are correlations and not causations. And it's very important not to get the two mixed up. Again, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say there was any causation. I didn't say all. So that's an irrelevant point. It doesn't bother you that a child who is autistic or a child that's been abused or a young gay girl are being told there's something wrong with you and you should probably change your, you know, your gender, take puberty blockers that render you infertile, never able to enjoy an orgasm and probably therefore uh, perhaps a full sexual relationship and will affect your, 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 your life forever. Maybe, maybe even let's mutilate your body by cutting off a healthy working part of your body. That, that doesn't make you feel physically sick because it makes me feel physically sick. Yeah, I think that is devastating, and obviously, it I think happens. that's devastating. I think I think children who uh, are forced or encouraged to transition uh, is another form of conversion therapy, and shouldn't be the case. You shouldn't force anyone to be anything that they aren't. Um, just on the point of of orgasms, I'm trans. I've had medical interventions, and you can have a pretty good one if you ask me. Um, um, it depends what drugs people have had. It depends what treatment they've had. But you know, again, again, saying, <laughs> oh, well, it's fine for me. No, this is this is medically proven. Some some of the an awful lot of the children who go on these kinds of drugs aren't able to ever do that. And that's you know they're not able to they're not able in the age of fourteen to say that's not going to bother me or it's okay. I don't mind being infertile because I don't want kids. Well, who which fourteen year old does want a kid? Oh, uh, Julia, on on your point about lesbians young lesbians who who are transitioning because they think it's easier to be trans than it is to be a lesbian i think no they think is, they think that they are trans yeah okay but but it doesn't mean that their experience is going to be easier because they are going to transition or because they want to transition it's not easier to be a lesbian or easier to be trans i think to conflate the idea that one identity is an easier identity than the other is is kind of a weird route to go I, I down. I think there's an it's awful lot of lesbians who would be listening to this show who might feel rather differently about that. Can I ask you one final question, though? Um, social transitioning, uh, something that uh, Hilary Cass... Uh, and again, that's what's a very well-balanced report. You know, um, She did also talk about the toxicity of the debate, which, which is exceptional, she says. And again... Um, as far as I'm concerned, all the toxicity came from the side calling people like me bigots for standing up for, for children's safety. But she said there was no clear evidence that social transitioning, so that is, you know, using someone's preferred pronouns or allowing them to change their name to a different gender name, um, has positive, or she said, interestingly, negative uh, impact. Um, where we don't have evidence for something, when it involves children, we shouldn't do it, should we? I think, actually... The wording in the report uses the word could, and uh, it's doing a lot of heavy lifting. Um, it's It says that there's an implication that this could be the case or it could might not be the case, and we don't actually know for sure, whereas we found that there were studies not as large as this study, not as large as this review. It hasn't taken um, quite quite the same uh, numbers and data, but there are plenty of studies from around the world that show that uh, choosing using someone's chosen pronouns and name does actually alleviate mental health distress. Yeah, so, but 
and and yet she's looked at all those studies and she's carried out a much bigger uh, look at everything top experts looking at it for a number of years major report and she hasn't found evidence isn't that funny do you not think that if we don't have evidence for something when it's involving children we don't do it she hasn't said that we haven't found evidence for it she's saying that it could do this she's not saying that it does or it doesn't she's saying maybe she's saying i don't know yeah and so we haven't got evidence and if and if we don't know 100%, if someone tells me, if you do X and that will make me happy, I'll do X because I will want to make that person feel as comfortable as they can, so long as it, yeah. they're not asking me to hurt anyone, to break the law, to, to do anything that I would consider... I'm, really I'm just going to go back to the anorexia issue. If, if a 14-year-old if a girl came to you and said, and who was painfully stick thin so sick then she's not having period she's you know she's fainting at school she is she is in a terrible physical state and she said would you help me with my diet because that is what will make me happy because i believe that i am too fat would you also affirm her view that she was that she was too fat the same way you would affirm her view if she said she thought she was a boy because that would make her I, happy i don't i don't have um any lived experience or like you just said you want to do what makes people happy Right, so I would try. So and that would that. make her happy, I right? Try, I would try and get that person the uh, support that they need. From well, she don't know. She wants to lose weight. She's too. She thinks she's too fat. Right, but that's. But but I, I also wouldn't. What's the difference? Because I, I wouldn't go around offering children. If she help came to you. Their body. She came to you. Around, she came I don't to go around saying no, but children, that's oh, no, let that's let a get out point. No, that, I'm asking you a philosophical point. You know, you're, you're yeah, making the logical point. You're saying I want to make people happy, so I'll affirm their views, even if I mean I would say their views are are, are completely not fact based. But you're saying, oh, oh, but I'm a bit more. I'm, I'm a bit. I'm not. I'm not going to actually affirm people's views and do what they want to make them happy if they've got another mental health dysphoria. It's it's a gender identity and eating disorders are two completely separate things b i don't have any expertise in that area and c i don't go around affirming children's bodies i don't know if you do but i certainly don't do that and so won't even engage in that yeah i think that's a get out if you ask me shivada david really appreciate uh, you joining us though really uh, good to talk to you she's a journalist i'm going to say she again not being disrespectful that's just what you are a journalist and a virgin radio presenter benedict spence is also in the studio your thoughts quickly on that very quickly i mean what was interesting is a couple of times you uh shivani and cited the report saying oh well we need to look again at this area there isn't enough evidence xyz the reason why there isn't a lot of evidence in certain areas around this conversation is because universities, especially in the United States, are terrified of conducting yeah. research. And anyone things. who started it was basically because hounded out. Because it is politically in, you know, not expedient to do this sort of thing because you don't want trans protesters turning up on your campuses, shutting yeah. things down, intimidating people. So it's simply not done because yeah. one side of the debate is not particularly open to the idea of scientific fact. Exactly. This. And again, I think, again, if they, if they, th if they thought there was loads of evidence for what they were doing, mm. they'd have been providing all that evidence, but they didn't look into it because they knew what they were doing was wrong. Mm. There are lots of texts and tweets coming in about this, asking for your reaction to this report. You can call on 0344 499 1000, text 87222, or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Uh, Wayne has done that and said, what is this left-leaning obsession with children all the time? Children should be children. Leave them alone. Here, here to that. Jules says, when will people start getting arrested? Institutionalised child abuse disgraceful i agree dot says this is the biggest scandal and child abuse do we really need a review to tell us how children are being abused by these doctors and uh, amanda says those responsible for instigating dangerous gender issues into classrooms and sidelining parents should also be prosecuted the irreversible harm done to some children in is, is in criminal and mark says anyone whose child turns up at the nhs looking for this service needs a welfare check i think a lot of people feel that way i'd say i also know parents who've gone through this and they are tearing their hair out trying to protect their kids against the ideologists online social media and uh, in the NHS and in the classrooms. Uh, let's uh, go to the calls now, though. Luke is on the line in Kent. Good afternoon to you, Luke. Hello, good afternoon, Kent, Julia. Thank you very much. For thanks thanks for calling. What do you want to say? No problem. I just, I just, yeah, I've not, I've got to be honest, I haven't really thought about uh, the trans issue in much detail. However, so there's a lot less coverage at the moment. Yeah. And I just, it is so concerning. One, I think that no way should any child be given the option to have puberty blockers, any sort of surgery, nothing at all, yeah. even considered until they are 18. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even then, I think that is, you know, I look back to when I was 18, and I think, Christ, some of the things I, you know, I did at that age, you're not mature enough to make a decision like yeah. that. Um, I feel 
you know, and I say this myself as a, you know, as a, as a gay man, uh, having grown up in the 90s, I think if this uh, topic was around when I was at school, and like you say, you know, Instagram, YouTube, all these social media, yeah. that is going to be nudging these children and giving them the idea. Yeah, that maybe, yeah, maybe you're not gay. Maybe, yeah. you're, maybe you're a woman. You're being a man's yeah. body and you should change yeah. your body. Yes, absolutely. It, 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 it's not, you know, it's, and I, you know, I, I know uh, for fact that, that one school child has actually said, you know, I can't be gay. I must be a woman. And it, yeah. it's just, it is just. Absolutely. I'm, I'm with you all the way. Luke, I think you're speaking for the nation there. Thank you so much for getting in touch. Really appreciate that. Uh, 12.30 is the time. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Well, uh, good afternoon to you. This is Talk uh, with me, Julia hartley -Brew. Thank you very much, Dee, for joining me. Benedict Spence still with me in the studio. Let's talk about what's been going on overseas, uh, where we've had some developments when it comes uh, to uh, Gaza and Israel. Not only have we had an interview with uh, Joe Biden, aired on American TV last night, although recorded a week ago, actually, uh, in which he has said that he believes that Benjamin Netanyahu is making mistakes with his policy in Gaza. Uh, we've also had the uh, American pr president saying he wants a six- to eight-week ceasefire in Gaza. That's echoed by Rishi Sunak, uh, of course, today, giving an interview, a pulled clip interview, saying that he believes that there should be an immediate pause uh, in uh, uh, fighting in Gaza to allow humanitarian aid in. 
And of course, our Foreign Secretary David Cameron over in Washington with the uh, US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, yesterday at a press conference saying there has been no change uh, to the legal advice on whether or not the UK can uh, send weapons to Israel. Let's talk about all of this uh, with Lord Derek. Kim Derek was, of course, the former UK ambassador to Washington and our former national security advisor as well. Uh, good afternoon to you, Kim. Good afternoon, Julia. Thanks for joining us. Uh, first of all, the significance of what Joe Biden had to say in terms of wanting an eight-week ceasefire and saying he believes Netanyahu is making mistakes. Is this a, a major sort of uh, for, you know, for change in his, in his policy or is this sort of just where, where we've been heading for quite some weeks now? I think, Julia, it's the next ratcheting up in a series of moves that you've seen from this administration in recent weeks, which accelerated after the... After the uh, the attack uh, that killed those those aid workers uh, a week ago. And you've seen the Israelis in response opening up uh, a couple of new channels into Gaza. They've withdrawn their troops from part of Gaza. Uh, and they uh, there seems to be some new impetus behind these negotiations on a temporary ceasefire and hostage release, though we've seen positive signals about that before, and it's not happened. So let's not 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 assume that's going to going to happen. Uh, and in calling for a, a prolonged ceasefire like that, Biden has kind of taken the next step. Uh, and he's, I mean, if we think about what the Israelis have done since that phone call between Biden and Netanyahu, I think on Sunday, um, he does seem to have a bit of leverage here. He does seem yeah. to be able to be pushing a bit because the Israeli position has changed. Yeah, a lot more aid going in. Changed. Exactly, yeah. Um, although, of course, we have still had Benjamin Netanyahu, a lot of people thinking that Rafa assault isn't going to happen. He said, nope, there is a date for that. We understand Israel has purchased 40,000 tents, which believes are moving people, civilians, out of Rafa into refugees uh, mm -hmm. camps. I mean, one assumes those are those tents are, you know, multi-man tents rather than uh, just for 40,000 people or so. Um, what do you think the likelihood that there will be that assault on Rafa, given the growing international unease about this um, and the growing pressure on Israel from key allies like the United States and UK? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. And I would have said before Netanyahu's latest pronouncements on this that, uh, that maybe it's not going to happen. But on yeah. the basis of what he said now, it would be a huge climb down by him if it didn't happen. So uh, we don't have a date for it yet, although he says he's decided when it's, going to, when it's going to be. I think international pressure on him will continue to ramp up. Of course, you know, if they did do an exceptional, brilliantly planned effort to remove all the, to evacuate all of the civilians from the area, I suppose it is conceivable that they could do this, this operation, this, this offensive, without too much, uh, too much harm, too much civilian... Yeah. And, and also, there isn't any point in the IDF forces going into Gaza to route out uh, uh, Hamas fighters in 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 Gaza City uh, and uh, and and other other towns and cities, and then to leave them a, a big bulk of them, a big, the rump of them, sitting there uh, quite happily in their tunnels um, in in Rafa. They need to be ousted from Rafa as well. I mean, I can imagine no other government thinking that it would be acceptable to leave this terrorist organisation able to just completely regroup again from Rafa. It, I mean, it seems to me to be utterly unreasonable for the West to expect that not to happen. But it is, of course, reasonable for us to say, and quite rightly, that we need to protect civilian life. And if it takes an awful lot longer and is an awful lot harder to do, then so be it. But the need to protect civilian yeah. life should be absolutely paramount. Look, that's a fair point. That's a fair point, Julia. Although I would say that the the often cited objective that Netanyahu has of complete destruction of Hamas, I think ultimately is unattainable no. because you just can't, can't quite achieve that. If it's true that there are still several Hamas battalions, as he says, in Rafa, and Israel has the right of self-defense, then yes, he has a case for going in. But it will be a very, very big operation to move all of those people out. Yeah. And so far, I think the Israelis have been a bit reckless in how they have done this operation. They haven't taken sufficient care to to uh, evacuate civilians or to protect civilians, and they haven't allowed enough food supplies and humanitarian supplies in. If they did all of those things, we might see it differently. But the the track record so far isn't good enough. So Except that's... probably better than anything the British Army or the American Army or any other army would be expected to do. 
Well, I think the British Army certainly would, would debate that with you, Julia, but, um, but you know... Really? I think the Israeli very... Army is always held to a higher account. I mean, look, it's interesting also, these talks in Cairo uh, you know, appear to be broken down when Hamas... Again, I don't know why people are calling for Israel to have a ceasefire. It's Hamas that needs to have a ceasefire. They're still uh, sending rockets and they're still you know, keeping uh, their you know, civilians as, as hum humanitarian shields and still holding those hostages. But it seems that it's broken down over the demand for at least 40 hostages to be released by Israel. It appears that Hamas are saying, really... The land. They don't have control of 40 of the hostages. Now, we understand 131 are still unaccounted for. It's thought that at least you know, 30 or so of those believed to have died uh, at some point during uh, the IDF assault on Gaza. Um, but, you know, if, if Hamas don't have control of 40 of those hostages, we know it still includes, you know, young women. Uh, we know we have horrific tales of, of you know, of, of rape, sexual abuse, torture and, and, and horrific treatment of, of these uh, hostages. Um, that, that is a real concern about what's happened to them, where they it are, is or is they even alive? It is a real concern, and I don't understand how Hamas can possibly claim that they don't have control of 40 of them. After all, they took them, they captured them, they are hiding them somewhere. So I don't... I don't you don't accept, accept that. that. Um, just finally, is there a battle going on at the heart of government, do you believe? You've been working, you've worked in Number 10, you've worked in the senior, you know, senior figure in the Foreign Office, you've been our most senior diplomat in Washington. Is there a battle going on at the heart of this government in terms of the level of support for Israel? Because we've had David Cameron, I think, being very critical publicly of Israel in a way that, say, the Deputy Prime Minister... Oliver Dowden wasn't uh, on Sunday morning it was in the wake of these uh, aid workers being killed tragically in this attack by the IDF. Um, and then David Cameron yesterday, um, speaking in Washington, said that the UK will not suspend arms exports to Israel. That's something that's been demanded. Won't publish that legal advice, um, but says the legal advice has not changed. Is there, is there a battle going on for how much support Israel is getting? Yeah, I, would, I think I would say I think there's been a debate going on. Um, across uh, the road between Downing Street and between the Foreign Office, um, amongst ministers. I'm sure the Minister of Defence has been involved as well. I think what David Cameron said yesterday um, kind of suggests to me that this debate has been settled, at least for the time being, yes. and we're not going to stop um, the very limited amount of arms that, and mostly it's spare parts, that we send to Israel. You can't rule out it reopening if something terrible like the killing of those aid workers happens again for the time being i think it has settled um and you know if david cameron didn't agree with it he wouldn't have said what he said yesterday so yeah. we are where we are now indeed well we shall see it's very much a moving story as always as it has been for the over six months now kim Derek, very much appreciate you joining us lord Derek, there of course is a former uk ambassador to the united states and former national security advisor um benedict spence um, you and i've talked about this so many times over the last six months mm. um do you think there is this battle going on? Do you think, for instance, that we should stop selling arms to Israel? No, I mean, it's, not it's, they make up more than 0.1% well, of their... Well, that's exactly the thing. It's unnecessary. It's an unnecessary diplomatic spat that you'd be getting in over, you know, materialistically nothing. It's of virtue any, signaling, it, isn't it? it? That's exactly what it is. No, I tell you what, well, I would United, say vice signaling. If the United States doesn't actually feel bad enough about sending their weapons, then why should we? Actually, they send far more. And other countries, Germany as well, has not gone, oh, dear, you know, breaches of international law, we better stop. They've not done that. So, actually, why... Why is the onus then on us that we spend uh, significantly less in terms of lethal weapons uh, to Israel? Why I think should we should we be that? sending Other... more. But again, we well, should we be holding... that to Ukraine because yes. Germany doesn't send exactly. weapons to Ukraine. We, yeah, so. we, should be, we, we, we should be holding the Israeli government and any ally, and we should hold our own government to account uh, over humanitarian aid. And the, look, there is an issue in terms of... The aid you know, is getting in. The aid is, you, the aid is getting in. You say the aid is getting the in, is but it ain't in. getting to the kids who need it. And that's the job of the IDF. Why? The idea is not no, in charge. No, 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 this is not true. This is no, not true. Under not. international law, uh, an invading force has a duty of care to the civilians. It who, gets who, in. The aid gets in and then it goes to NGOs. Well, the aid the wasn't NGOs getting in and not enough aid is getting it in. Is the getting aid in is now. getting in. Yeah. It is getting 40, in. 40,000, no, so 40 trucks or 400 trucks, even 4,000 trucks isn't enough for 2.3 million I'm, people. I'm sorry, but ultimately you don't get to decide when wars start. And I also have to say, there's something incredibly amusing, it would be amusing if people weren't dying, about British and American armchair generals sort of sitting 
sitting back and saying, oh, the IDF hasn't done that very well, oh, they could have been doing this better. Does anybody know what we did in Raqqa or Fallujah? Does anybody yeah. pay attention to the, how many people died there, the sort of munitions we were using? It was appalling, the number of civilians who died unnecessarily. But, of course, when it's the Israelis, well, that's different, of course. Yeah. You've got to hold them to a different standard. We make virtually every single day, I have to say. Look, I'm just going to um, take a short break, then I want to come back. We've got a few more of res your uh, responses uh, on this cast review about treatment of children who believe they're trans. And then we're also going to be talking about the ULES policy in London, the ultra-low emissions zone, supposed to make our air cleaner. It was already clean. Uh, and it was also supposed to reduce traffic. That's weird, because in the five years it's been in place, we've seen more traffic. What's going on? We'll talk about that up next. This is Talk. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good afternoon. This is Talk with me, Julia hartley -Brew. Thank you so much for your company. I, I have to say, um, your response has been quite overwhelming in, in terms of this cast review into uh, treatment of uh, children who believe they are trans and uh, basically calling for an end to, frankly, what has been a shocking medical scandal. I've been asking for your reaction and your messages are extraordinary. Julia, another Julia, says, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I was NS an NSPCC volunteer giving talks to primary school children on safety and abuse for nine years. I resigned in 2022 when they started actively encouraging kids to identify as trans transgender. They refused to listen to me when I complained and confronted them with facts about the dangers of this ideology. Uh, Jeff says, let's hope the NHS has started to put money in the pot for the backlash of lawsuits they'll face in years to come when these confused kids are adults and searching for compensation. Hannah points out, when the number of trans children jumps from 50 to 3,000, it's obvious something is wrong. That's indeed what, what happens in, at the T Tavistock Clinic. Uh, and Sid says, keyword being children. My kid thinks he's Spider-Man, but as a parent, I don't let him jump off buildings. Final one, Bernie. 
Julia, really, we knew at 18 months that my then nephew was born in the wrong body. You have to treat every person as an individual. Luckily for you, presumably you don't have experience of this. For those truly born into the wrong body, it's so difficult. You had an 18 months old nephew, not then nephew, still your nephew, a boy born in the wrong... How on earth could you think that an 18 months old is born in the wrong body? This is... This is what is happening to kids, is that family members are doing... You're doing that to a child. No child is born in the wrong body. You're born into your body. You might be a tomboy. You might be quite an effeminate girl, a boy. Uh, you, 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 whatever. You don't conform to the exact ideas that 1950s like Barbie and Ken ideas of what a, a, a male or a female are. But you're still who you are and what you are. What you were born, a boy or a girl, is what you stay for the rest of your life. I, I despair messages like that. Benedict Spencer with us? At 18 months, how can, it, how can a, a toddler have the concept of this? How can it articulate these things? It's, it's a nonsense to say, oh, well, we knew. Mm, no, absolutely not. You're right. You're imposing You're that. You're imposing on that. A, on, on, on an animal that doesn't have the capacities yet. It's not old enough yet. It's, it's, you know, it's, it it's is entirely at sorry, your mercy. Um, Bernie, a child of that age. Bernie, that's child abuse. That's child abuse. Just, just call it what it is. Right now, let's uh, talk about a final topic uh, in this hour before we uh, go and hand over to Kev and Alex. Um, congestion in London, our capital city, is now worse than when the ultra low emission zone, that famous ULES zone, was launched five years ago, rather undermining the benefits of the clean air scheme. New figures show that the daily average congestion level in the capital was 45% last year. That's up from 37% in 2019 uh, when the uh, Mayor of London, uh, Sadiq Khan, launched the scheme. Of course, we were told it would not only improve our air quality, uh, it's already been going up and it was fine anyway. Um, and we're told that the latest expansion to a wider zone, the whole of the M25 area, would improve our air again. Not an issue. Um, but also that it would cut congestion. I never really understood how it could do both necessarily. Well, let's talk about this with my next guest. He's at Leo Murray. He's director of the climate action charity Possible. Uh, good uh, afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Julia. No, thanks so much. We're told, oh, well, this wasn't about cutting congestion. I remember it was definitely billed at the time as a way of cutting congestion. Charge people to go drive their cars uh, and lorries or whatever into the centre of town um, and then they won't do it. I know for a fact I've not driven into town since. It definitely worked on me. It's a massive charge, uh, to, to, so I simply don't do it. I'll, I'll, I'll get a cab instead or, or, or use the tube, which is what I was doing mostly anyway. But, but congestion has actually risen. How is that possible? Well, it's not... It's not a congestion charge. I think that when the ULES was first introduced, there was a reduction in traffic because people who were driving non-compliant vehicles stopped doing it. But exactly as expected over time, people have switched those dirty vehicles for slightly cleaner vehicles, and now they're driving those into London. And so as a consequence, you know, that doesn't help with the congestion at all. So it wasn't, it, what is true is that the ULES has improved air quality in London, which was the purpose of the I policy. don't think there is any proof of that. Air quality in London was already going up, was always very good. Again, there was some idea that we were living in, like, sort of, you know, 1950s pea supers. Absolutely load of nonsense. The the the, the, uh, the the air pollution in London has been massive, and in mo everywhere around the country, has been massively improving over the last 100 years, and was already improving before ULES, and hasn't improved by a larger amount because of ULES. So that's just... I don't believe that's a claim that's even viable. Well, it's it's a claim which is supported by the medical professional community in London. Is it? Yes, very much so. There's an extremely strong consensus in favour of ULES expansion amongst pa paediatricians in London hospitals. Yes, you could talk to any of those. Mm -hmm. so this is a well-documented fact that um, air quality has been improving in London and it's been... No, it was improving before that ULES. It doesn't improve by magic, Julia. It no, it improved, improved because, no, because vehicles were getting cleaner anyway. What has happened since ULES was introduced is we have accelerated the process of getting the very... No, I, no, I don't believe the stats right. do show that. Someone can correct me, but I'm pretty sure there was a study recent, you know, in the last year which showed that actually it hadn't improved at an increasing rate. So it was just, there was already improving. Air. But the key thing is, look, here's the thing. We live in a city. Well, I live in a city. This is where our studio is right now. Um, and yeah. many other people living in other cities around the country and indeed around the world. We expect that if the air isn't as beautiful and pure as when you're living in the middle of a countryside, up a mountain or by the seaside. We accept that. It's part of the, sort of the cost of doing business of living in a city. We also accept that there's going to be a lot of traffic around us. I never understand people being upset about traffic when they're living in a big city. If you want to live somewhere without traffic, go and live in the middle of nowhere. So well, why, why do we need to tackle either issue? 
there's a few things going on there. So first of all, children that grow up in London are growing up with permanently deficient lung capacity as a consequence of breathing poor quality air while they're There is some evidence that some children who live near and go to school near very, very busy main roads um, are suffering from this, but not the vast majority of children in our city. I mean, that's, that's, any one child is, is one too many. It's but... having lifetime effects on children that are growing up here, so that is a reason to worry about it. But it's also resulting in thousands of premature deaths. And that, no, again... No, it's, again, completely made-up nonsense. That is about... It's, that's well, an average, yeah, it's an average just... amount of time taken off the average person's life over their lifetime. Losing a few hours or a few days or even a few weeks from your lifetime from having the benefits of not just cars and buses and trains, but fridges and electricity and heating and all the other things that make modern life possible. So there's two there's two things. You just spouted a whole load of nonsense. You you don't you don't believe the I don't believe anything. It's not about belief. I know. I know I, there's either a I fact or isn't a fact. That. Okay, so yes, but a academics, the academic community I know the academic study you're talking about, and that's not what it actually that's not what the data says. Okay. No, it's so not. It's categorically not yes. what the data says. So I, I, I understand that you don't believe the It's not about, it's not a belief. World, world, world renowned university. It's not a belief. No, no, no. It's yes. been extrapolated yes, and used by the I mayor and other campaigners them. to pretend that thousands of people are dying because we live in the 21st century. It's a load of abject nonsense. People, as a result of general pollution, not just from cars, but from having no, electricity, from are, are going cars. to lose a few days or hours off their life. It's mostly from cars, but it's not just that. It's implicated in all sorts of things. It's implicated in dementia. You know, it's implicated in 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 teenage psychosis. This is this is Such like a load of nonsense. So, so look, but let's just stop talking about air quality for a moment because I thought you made right, an interesting. We've got a minute left. Go for it. Uh, about traffic. Why do people worry about traffic in cities? If you don't like it, go and live in the countryside. Well, actually, you can visit cities in Europe that have broadly got rid of car traffic in their Yeah, no one can get anywhere. They are much nicer places Tiny to little be. places oh, like Amsterdam. We can all cycle across the whole of a massive metropolis like London. Come on. I'll have to leave it there. But, Leo Murray, thank you for joining us. Come join us another time. We've got a bit more time. Benedict Spence. I mean... I live in a city. Yeah. It's one of the greatest cities on earth. Well, I'm sorry, I'd say the greatest. There's going to be traffic. Get over I it. I was going to say, so sort, of, sort of tiny medieval European cities are not really comparable yeah. to British cities that grew during the Industrial Revolution and that's where they came from. Yeah, it's yeah. very nice to live in Bologna or wherever it is and you walk everywhere, but there also aren't that many factories or that many jobs. Not many people are moving to those areas. They tend to be moving away from them. Uh, and exactly. There's a reason for uh, exactly. That. Thank you very much, Benedict. It's been a pleasure you. to have your company. Up next after the break, it's Cross Talk with Kevin and Alex. I'm back tomorrow. This is Talk. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's Carrie.